Morena, everyone. Thank you very much for being here this morning at our Environment and Climate Change Committee. Sorry, just getting back to the the agenda. We have um, two apologies for absence, uh, Councillor Newman and Councillor Cooper. Uh, we have two possible apologies for early departure. That'll be Councillor Mulholland and Councillor Fletcher. And we have two apologies for lateness, Councillor Collins and Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Could I have a... Oh, and uh, Member Wilcox is in the room. He's just on another Zoom call, so we'll just have... Um, apologies for lateness, although he's here, but if, yeah, officially here, but not in the room, so cool. And we could I have a mover that Councillor Stewart and a seconder Councillor Simpson? All those in favour? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Now we have three um, applications for attendance via Skype. So we've got Councillor Dalton, Councillor Mulholland, and Councillor Sayers, and they. Um, Councillor says is not quite online yet, but we'll move those. Um, Councillor Young, second. Councillor Simpson, all those in favour? Aye. Aye. Everyone's very lively this morning. <laughs> um, any declarations of interest? Nope. Uh, confirmation of the minutes. Could I have a mover? Counts uh, uh, Deputy Chair Pippacoom and a seconder, Councillor Young. All those in favour? Those against? Uh, any petitions? No. Nope. Uh, public input. We have two requests that were declined, and I read out why. Mm -hmm. So we had um, Tane uh, Ferry. We've got his email. Uh, Tane Ferry. We've got his different name here, sorry, um, for understanding order 7.7.3C, um, as it was not appropriate at this time to speak on the issue because of the vice Kurora Little Penguin Monitoring and Management Plan is currently before Council for the approval in accordance with the conditions of the consent for Kennedy Point Marina, um, which has been through a court process. The second decline request was Bianca Ranson from Māori, uh, Māori Te Moana, um, once again, the standing order 7.7.3 is not appropriate at this time to discuss um, issues in relation to the revised Kororoa um, Little Penguin Monitoring and Management Plan, and which is currently before the Council for approval in accordance with the conditions of the consent for Kennedy Point Marina, which have been through a court process. So I don't need to move anything there. No. No? Perfect. Uh, local board... Input, we have none. We have no extraordinary items. And now we moved to item eight. We have Chris Thurston, the head of sustainability at Watercare. And he is going to give an update. And we've got a presentation as well. We'll just get um, let Chris go completely through his presentation and then we'll head to questions after that. Thank you, members. Kia ora, Chris. Kia ora, Kato. <clears throat> Kia ora, everyone. Thank you so much for the invitation to um, join you today to give an update on some of the work that Watercare has been doing in the sustainability space, and um, that includes, in particular, um, a range of climate change action work. I wanted to just really quickly frame a little bit of Watercare's approach to sustainability. Um, I guess I'm privileged to have the title and role of Head of Sustainability at Watercare, and I've been in the role for just coming up to three years now. But there's a bit of a structure that we use to help consider the sustainability approach within the organisation, and it comes from a, a bit of a tiered approach, I guess, from a global perspective. We think of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. In particular, SDG 6 is around clean water and sanitation, so that's one that inherently links with, with the work that Watercare does. But there's a number of others on there, and I, I, I try not to pick favourites, but number 13 of climate action is, is personally my favourite. But we think about a number of these when we think about the work that we do as an organisation and the, contribute, the role that we have to contribute towards a better world, which is what the United Nations are, achieve, are attempting to achieve. 
Um, in the top right corner of the slide, you'll see fully sustainable. That's one of the four strategic objectives of the organization. And that guides us in the work that we do and the decisions that we make. It guides us in the way that we look at the organization and it guides us um, as individuals. There's three com key component parts underneath that. One is to protect and enhance the natural environment. The others is to be a, a corporate, uh, responsible corporate organization. And finally, to meet our legal, um, our legal obligations. So within that, it has both a regulatory component, but also that protect and enhance the natural environment. And those parts um, drive our organization. The bottom right of that slide um, is a representation of the six capitals of integrated thinking. Watercare uses the six capitals, um, natural capital in the top left, through to financial capital in the bottom right, but also including stakeholder and community, people and culture, assets, and also intellectual capital to think about how we create value. And the capitals, if you're not too familiar with them in this context, is about a stock. And you can have a stock of money, which is financial capital, which can be increased or decreased. But we also think about the stocks that we have across each of these capitals. These are used um, in, in things like our annual report to discuss how we talk about value. They're used within our board papers when we think about making a decision. Do we have an integrated lens across all of these considerations? Um, and they're also used as another lens for us as individuals in the company. But in the bottom left, I guess I just wanted to really mention that for us, being a water organisation and being intrinsically linked to the natural environment, we're, we're guardians and we're privileged to be part of working with water um, every single day. And by working with water, we work with the lands, we work with um, the people, the birds, the animals, and absolutely everything. And that sort of intrinsic link is something that guides and frames some of the work that we do. Um, from a structural perspective, there's a couple other points to make. The sustainability team is small, it's me and one other, plus someone that works um, on the Central Interceptor project specifically. But when I do the part of the water care induction for new staff, I welcome them to the sustainability team. And I say, welcome to water care and welcome to sustainability. It might not say it in your job title yet, but unofficially it does. And you have the opportunity to make a difference in every single role that you have, whether it's a customer care representative, or if it's someone who is working um, on our faults, whether that's nice clean drinking water or dealing with sewage, you have a role to play in, in, in helping um, Auckland and helping sustainability. Uh, John Lamont passes on his apologies um, to join us today, but he has um, only been in the role for, for coming up to five months, but is a, um, I'm pleased to say he's a champion of the work um, that I've had with him so far. And Steve Webster, our Chief Infrastructure Officer, is the sponsor for climate change activities on our executive. So that's sort of a structure of how it works within our organisation. For today, I'm going to give an overview of our key focus areas. I think we only have 20 minutes on the agenda, so um, I was given 10 originally and asked for a bit more because I thought it was going to be impossible to get through the work that, that we are doing, and I still think this will be a, a bit of a rushed presentation. So if there is more information that you'd like, I do welcome those questions, and I can come back to you with more information. I'll finish off with a couple of challenges and opportunities. These things could be the same. Um, and it just shows a little bit of the direction that we're trying to take the organisation. So preparing for climate change. Um, we know that climate change impacts are real and we know that they are facing us every single day. Water care and water um, will see the effects of climate change first. And we started our climate change journey in 2017 when it hit us right in the face with the Tasman Tempest. And that was an extreme, extreme weather event. Um, with three months of rain within, within two days, and we know that it impacted our ability to process water and service Aucklanders. And that was a wake-up call for us to think about this happening more uh, frequently in the future. We're all familiar with the um, water supply challenges and the drought that we've had within the last 18 months, and we know that these are going to be becoming more frequent. So Watercare has seen it um, over the last four years, and it's not something that is our future, it's something that we're seeing today. Watercare created a climate change strategy in 2019, and I've presented this um, strategy to this group before. I think it was about two years ago, 18 months ago, perhaps. Um, and it has a focus on understanding the impacts of climate change today and the variabilities that we are seeing so that we can plan for more of them into the future. This sky to sea diagram highlights the role that Watercare has from the dams and the hanuas or wherever our water source is through a treatment plant, a series of pipes to our customers, to our people of Auckland, whether that's residential or commercial, then flush the 
flush the toilet and it goes down another series of pipes to treatment plants and ends up in our natural environment and then creates a natural cycle again. And within the sky to sea, we know that climate change will have an impact on us. And that is more severe weather events. It is droughts. It is increased temperature, which will, increase to, which will lead to increased demand of water in the future. We know that a number of our assets and, and the assets of our communities are near, uh, are near the sea. So within our climate change strategy, we have 14 portfolios, we call them. It's a breakup of how we focus our work. Nine of those are focused on the adaptation side of our work, and five of them are focused on mitigation. I'll be diving into a little bit more detail on each of those um, shortly. On the adaptation side, one of the key components we recognise is that there is uncertainty. And the IPCC brought out their report in the last couple of days to reduce some of that uncertainty about the impacts that we're going to face, but the uncertainty is very much still there. And with uncertainty, especially over an extended period of time, comes some challenges, because we're making decisions today that we have to think about the, the environment, the climate that they're going to be facing um, over that 100 years. So we've been using an approach called the Dynamic Adaptive Pathways Planning Approach, DAP, um, it's a theoretical approach that we've been putting into practice and um, I guess we're pleased to see and we've been working with um, the likes of Judy Lawrence who's a, a practitioner in this and is also on the Climate Commission around the actual use of something like these pathways. And this is a, a really high level representation but it's sort of that metro map approach where you have trigger points along the bottom and the trigger points might be um, population growth but it also might be a climate change impact, it might be sea level rise. Um, along the bottom and what we've got here and I, it's, it's impossible to read but the point is that we've got a water treatment option at the top and a wastewater treatment option at the bottom and we're going along pathways where we can make a decision where we might not be able to go any further if we go down that path if we act one way but we want to keep our pathways as open as possible so that we can keep them available for new ways of doing things and that might mean a relocation of an asset it might be the way we upgrade an asset it might be looking at um, a consent for a treatment plant, do we need to keep that treatment plant into the future? And all of these options, uh, having all of these options on the table, allow us to consider what might be the best possible approach. And with the intent, and this becomes the challenge, the intent not to lock us into one pathway, which would, enable, which would not enable us to achieve any of the others, um, depending on how those, those trigger points occur. Like I said, this has been a theor theoretical practice um, that has been studied, and we're putting it into, into reality with a number of our planning approaches. That might be for one specific asset. We're doing a bit of work with Helensville at the moment and the future approaches for that part of, um, of Auckland. But it also might be, and the treatment plan associated with that, or it might be a whole region, and it might be looking at the Whangaproa Peninsula and the northern environment to see where would we put water and wastewater services into the future knowing that population will change, um, sea level rise will occur and will have other impacts as well. So this is a tool that we are um, exploring and it's having quite a lot of success for us to enable us to open up our options into the future. Quickly on the adaptation side, um, I was asked not to talk too much about drought. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of other opportunities for that discussion. But just a really quick point to say that the investment that's been made over the last 12 months and the progress on the diversified supply um, is one of the biggest comp key components of our climate change work to look at supply of water into the future for Aucklanders. On the reducing emissions side, the climate change strategy establishes three key targets for us. As I mentioned, it was um, originally created in 2019 and we've been working um, on the creation and implementation of Tatariki Atafiri, and with that has been a reflection of our own strategy. So when we started in 2019, our, our, um, our reduction target was a 45% reduction in operational emissions by 2030. The work that the city has done in the alignment with C40 has said 50% is the target, and Watercare has embraced that challenge to add a bit more onto ours that we can look to achieve, um, achieve that in line with the rest of the council group and the city. I jumped uh, past the net zero emissions by 2050, but that is also the key, the key target for us um, in thinking about our future, especially as we add new infrastructure to think about the world that that infrastructure will play in over the next 100 years. Finally, we have a reduction target around our construction. So Watercare, as you're aware of, will be building a number of assets in the future, 
and we're looking at how we can ensure that those are built with climate change and carbon reduction in mind. I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more about that in a second. We've got a couple of great opportunities. Our wastewater treatment plants um, collect, uh, collect sewage and through that we get methane. Through methane we're able to generate electricity and we're aiming for our treatment plants to be energy neutral. They're currently sitting, this is at our two major plants at Mangere and at Rosedale, they're currently sitting in the 50 to 60% range of energy neutrality. So they're almost, you know, they're more than half of their energy comes from a self-sufficient source. And over um, to 2030, we're aiming for those to be 100% energy neutral. That comes from one, being as efficient as we possibly can at the sites, two, maximising that biogas that we have, using additional um, uh, methods to create more biogas, and finally looking at additional use of land in that area, uh, and you'll be familiar with the Rosedale Floating Solar Array, which supports that energy neutrality as well. The team at the moment is working on this decarbonisation roadmap for these targets, and it's not one that I have the update for you or the answer for you on today. But what we have done is created um, value streams in each of our key areas. So in wastewater, how are we going to deliver low carbon wastewater? Within water supply, how are we going to deliver low carbon water supply? Um, on top of that, in our infrastructure, how will we deliver that to a, to a low carbon way? And the wraparounds are low carbon finance, low carbon supply chain, low carbon fleet. Um, so the wraparounds are there to support us. This team has been established at a senior executive level, a senior management level within the organisation, and the intention is for them to create the roadmap to, um, to 2030 and to pass that to 2050 to achieve our targets. In the shorter term, um, our statement of intent requires us to establish a climate change performance measures on reducing our emissions in the shorter, in the shorter term. So for the next SOI, you will see annual, um, annual climate or carbon targets greenhouse gas emission targets over the, over the next three years. This is a real challenge for us as we're looking at um, balancing uh, water security for Auckland and the increased emissions associated with, um, with those water sources, as well as a growing population, um, and then the targets that we have. So the balances between meeting all three. Really quickly, the Rosedale Floating Solar Array. Um, was, um, it was launched, it was launched in November last year, um, and this has been something that has been a, a fantastic opportunity for us. It was something that was new to New Zealand. No one had done a floating array. We had we'd seen the opportunity that there was this piece of real estate that, um, that wasn't being used that we thought we could turn into something that was very positive for the organisation, and we had great partners from, um, from Vector PowerSmart who were, who were keen on the project as well and supported us. The project supports about 20% of the um, of the Rosedale uh, wastewater treatment plant there, and it takes up only 3% of the surface of um, of that of that treatment pond. Um, it's a bit of a test for us, and it's one that we think that we can do more of in the future. Um, it's been performing at the expected output, so we've had it in since November, and it's done it's done what it said it would do. So, so we're really pleased that the, the pilot has been um, successful to date. And this is just one, we believe that there is um, opportunity for water care in particular because of um, latent land that we have, especially around wastewater treatment plants. There's a lot of land that might be required for odour buffer or for, for some other use that can't be developed, and we think that opportunities like solar um, PV is something that could be pretty uh, beneficial for us. Um, and on top of that, it provides us with a stable price path for electricity, which achieves our objectives um, also for, for the community. The second part of reducing emissions for us is around our infrastructure. Capital carbon or infrastructure carbon is the emissions associated with delivering new treatment plants, new piping projects, so that we can support Aucklanders. This infrastructure carbon comes from the materials that you use. The carbon and steel is a pretty common type of material for water infrastructure and it's highly carbon intensive. It comes from the transportation of those products to our sites and it also comes from the uh, construction effort, whether we're digging a tunnel or um, digging a tunnel or digging a trench or using a digger, all of that has emissions associated with it. When we were reviewing our infrastructure approach, we realised we could build better infrastructure. And this is a vision that's come out into the organisation that has three key components. And this is the vision that you see in front of you today that we term 402020. 
someone asks me why doesn't it add up to 100 and I say it's about the vision for the future that we have. So 402020 is around reducing our infrastructure carbon by 40%, reducing the cost to deliver that infrastructure by 20%, and also improving the health, safety and wellbeing outcomes every single year um, by 20%. The beauty of this for me is that it's not one or the other, it's absolutely all three. Some people might say that reducing carbon will cost more, and we're absolutely here to challenge them with that. One of the best things that you can do is, is decide whether you can need to build this infrastructure at all. And if you can find an opportunity to not build the infrastructure, whether that's through an operational outcome or, or some, other, um, yeah, some other operational outcome, then you have the opportunity to reduce the carbon by 100%, maybe 90-something. You're obviously going to reduce the cost and you, you reduce the opportunity for any harm to occur on that construction site. So the, the bringing these three together um, has been the way that we are looking at building better infrastructure. And this has now become a mantra for our team. So our infrastructure team, who have previously been um, rewarded for building and planning infrastructure, has now been given the challenge to say, can you build nothing at all? And if you can't build nothing at all because we need it, can you build and achieve that exact same outcome with less infrastructure? Can it be achieved in some other way? And we believe that um, this vision is, is doable. Um, we've seen it overseas and we've taken um, a lot of context from other organisations, especially water utilities who are leading the way. And we believe that this is a, an opportunity that has benefit for New Zealand. Um, the construction sector accord, uh, private and um, public partnership at government level, has recognised this approach as one of what they call a beacon project for ones that other organisations in New Zealand can learn, for, uh, learn from. Sorry. Um, I think the best thing for me is it creates a mindset shift for our organisation. It says for our planners and, and planners that sustainability is right um, at the core of the work that we do. And this is a target for all of our infrastructure. So it will come through in all of our work. Moving on quickly um, from the climate change work into another pillar which I call thriving nature. And this is the relationship that we have with the natural environment that we, that we do every single day. Um, the Hanua Native Regeneration Project, I've got a slide on that coming up, but there's a number of other things that Watercare does every single day to support um, biodiversity and to support um, thriving nature. We um, are lucky to be working beside um, the Manukau Harbour uh, with the Mangere Wastewater Treatment Plant, one of the most incredible places for migratory birds in New Zealand, and the work that our team does to create bird roosts and to clear, um, to clear, clear pest species along the foreshore supports these migratory birds to thrive. Um, the team are really, um, really proud of the work that they do there, and it's something that's really important for them. We do a bunch of other biodiversity improvement projects. We recently, last year, um, released 100 long fin eels into one of our dams to control pest species. So some of the perch and the other types of um, fish in those dams that are introduced species, interestingly enough, um, have a water quality impact for us. But also there's a biodiversity issue there. So we trialled releasing these, um, releases these, these long fin deals into the, into the dam and they've, um, they were pretty stoked uh, with, the, with the food that they could get and we were stoked with the outcomes associated with it. Um, and that is using nature as a, as a friend, right? That's using nature as our friend to support the outcomes that we have. There's a number of other programs like this, um, including others when we do have large infrastructure projects such as the... Um, the proposed take from the Waikato uh, and also our Huia treatment plant, we understand that we do have an impact. So we look at alternative ways to, to ensure that we first of all minimise any impact that we have during that, and then on the flip side, look at additional enhancements that we can make during um, for the life of, of that project. That is the balance of the protect and then the opportunity for enhancement. The Hanua Native Forest Regeneration is, is up there as one of, um, one of my favourite projects, but one that we should all be really proud of. This is planting um, 8 million native trees over 1,900 hectares in the Hanua Ranges. It was originally established as an opportunity to protect our major water sources in the Hanuas, um, but we know that it's far more than that. And we know that um, the move from a commercial forestry to a native forest will support the outcomes for uh, resilience for our water supply but we know that the biodiversity outcomes are incredible. We know on top of that, that we will create a forest and a park for Aucklanders to enjoy in the, in the years to come. The progress has been really good. And just in the last couple of weeks, we've trialled um, a New Zealand first drone dispersal, 50,000 um, 50, pallets it has um, every few minutes. So we're looking at ways to 
get larger distribution, especially into some of the hard to reach areas. And this is a project that um, has garnered some good interest, especially with the universities about how this could be trialled in other areas around New Zealand as well. From a, another pillar we term circularity, and this is the concept about turning waste into value. Watercare is blessed with the waste that we receive down our pipes every single day, um, but it's a concept about moving away from a linear economy into one that's more circular and looking for ways that we can, um, that we can make value from these waste streams. Pukatutu Island rehabilitation is one of, it, is one of them. Yeah, around 80% of Auckland's waste goes through the Mangari, uh, of Auckland sewage goes through the Mangari wastewater treatment plant. And we, stay, we stabilise the solids that come out of that and are using it to rebuild the Pukatutu Island into a maunga to restore it to its, um, to its previous beauty that it was. The project's going to take, take a few years, um, but once it is there, once again, it will be a park that will be returned to Aucklanders. The alternative of this would be sending all of these biosolids to landfill um, and the emissions associated with that, as well as the filling up of, of Auckland's landfills, which is obviously not something that we want. We've got a native nursery that we're working on out at Mangere as well for more, for more planting, either into the um, Hanuas or into other areas around Auckland. And we're trialling using some of the byproducts of the wastewater treatment plant to support the growth of those, whether that's currently treated wastewater. Um, and I believe that um, some of this group are familiar with a product that, um, that we are working on. Yeah, so <laughs> I, don't want to, I didn't want to steal Rob's thunder because he's so passionate about this. Um, so I won't delve into too much detail, but it's another example of circularity. It's about turning a waste product into something. Um, and previously, I, I, as I understand, you used to be able to turn up to Mangere with your trailer and get some out the back. Um, so now we've turned it into a little bit, uh, something a little bit more, um, I don't know, a little bit more formalised. Um, but it's an opportunity for Aucklanders to have that full circularity back into their, back into their gardens. Finally, uh, the final pillar of the sustainability work for water care is around people, culture and leadership. Um, we truly do believe that water is a taonga, that water is a precious resource that we have the opportunity to interact with for a small period of time on its journey. And that is a concept that we're integrating into our work. Last year, we launched the Water for Life website, which is a way to share that with the community. Instead of just coming to a water care's website to pay a bill or complain about um, a broken pipe, we also want to share the knowledge that we have around this precious resource that we have. We created a special area for that, um, they're called the Water, Water for Life, and that's a sort of sub-brand of ours to enable all of that information to be available whilst also servicing Aucklanders on those specific needs that they might have when they come to us. Watercare, through a, through a great partner of ours, Ecomatters, it's an um, environment trust out, um, uh, out west, I guess, um, that does a, number of, a lot of work with Auckland Council, but specifically with Watercare, um, they do an in-home water audit service. And they are probably the forerunners of expertise in residential water auditing in New Zealand. The relationship with them has been going um, for a long time um, and we do around 200 water audits every single year where they spend up to two hours in someone's home going through every single fitting, every single shower head. They look at the washing machine and as, on top of that they also think about um, the behaviours. So what are the behaviours that you might have as an Aucklander and how could, in, in your home and how could those be slightly changed or amends to also align with water efficiency. The um, integration of sustainability in, into our decision making is an ongoing one and we're using the capitals um, to allow us to support that. And we also have a stated objective in our work and it's one that I um, try and support wherever possible around industry leadership. Whether that's in New Zealand and that's the work that we can do to support other councils with their water work or other water utilities, whether it's overseas um, and we've had some success with that with um, the the 40 2020 and some of the Australians are now asking us about how we how we can do that so what is the leadership position that we can provide within the organization external to the organization we have an environmental advisory group this is a group of what we call um trusted yeah trusted allies I guess um and they have a range of expertise and we work with them to support us on and challenge us and to question us on the work that we're doing the, the group um, is headed up by Paul Walbrun, who is a um, previous councillor many years ago, um, and has then a range of expertise on it from academia, 
Maturanga Māori, um, legal and regulatory, um, and has a geographic spread as well. And the work that they've, the, some of the examples of the work that they support us on um, during the early days of our climate change strategy, they review it and they challenge us and they see whether this is a, aligned with the community expectations that we have and provide us with that early insight. Um, around the Hanua forest regeneration work, they challenge us around um, any concept of, um, of herbicide use and they provide recommendations around what that might look like. There's environmental scientists on the group as well. Finally, um, I put this up as part of leadership and this is a, um, a project that we have in association with the Auckland Council Finance Group is around green bonds. And we have millions of dollars of our assets that are currently put up as part of a green bond, um, as part of a green bond, also with our friends from Auckland Transport. Um, and that green bond is put on the market because of the sustainability criteria that each of these assets meet. We dipped our toe and put about 50 million of assets in in the first round, and we're just adding about 250 million of assets to that going forward. Two, ooh, three more slides. The central interceptor, um, you've, I'm sure you've heard about it. It's a fantastic um, tunnel that's going to support outcomes for Auckland's beaches and for Aucklanders, reducing overflows. But as, a, as such a sort of hero or key project of us, we really wanted to push the boat out on, in considering sustainability in the design and the delivery of this project. So on its own, it's delivering incredible outcomes, but how we deliver it, we also had to have some consideration. So ISCA is an acronym for a certification scheme. It's called the Infrastructure Sustainability um, Council of Australasia, or Australia. I try and call it Australasia as much as I can um, so that we can have it here in New Zealand. And ISCA is a, a very robust sustainability certification that asks us to look through um, a whole range from toxicity to noise disturbance to carbon emissions to energy use to water use, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, Watercare and the City Rail Link is another example of an organisation who's using ISCA. We currently have a leading, design, a leading rating for our design, and we'll be and are tracking towards something similar to that for the delivery of the project. Just recently, um, we were pleased to um, partner with ECA, the Energy Efficiency and Conservation Fund um, Authority for the Low Emission Vehicle Fund, and we've received some funding to support some electrification of, of heavy trucks. These will be some of the largest electric vehicles in, um, in New Zealand, and we'll use them, use them for spoil recovery. So as, we, uh, as the TBM moves through uh, on its journey, then a lot of spoil comes from that, and it has a very clear pathway of, the, of where it needs to go. So we're investing in these three, um, three to begin with, uh, electric vehicles that will support us. You can see there the photo is of the um, of the battery swap. So the beauty of this is that there'll be one extra battery than you need, and that it can continue on a cycle and just have a five minute changeover for um, for the battery. So there's no there's no waiting around. Those will be here in January. Fingers crossed. Two slides. A couple of challenges that we have. One is the balance. The balance of the work that we want to do in the growing city, and the work that we have in new infrastructure. And, but then considering where the, the city will be growing, the climate change impacts associated with sea level rise, where those communities will, will be in the future, and the environmental limits that we play with them. The balance of water security and delivering the services that we deliver every day, as well as the um, increasing discharge consent requirements, each of those are more energy intensive than we have had in the past. So we have to have that balance between meeting our climate change objectives and that balance of the natural environment and our climate targets. Um, the objective here is to decouple them, so they don't have to be a linear combination between increasing growth and increasing emissions. We need to decouple them, but that is absolutely the challenge. As more people join our city, we are required to deliver more services. Um, for water care, that's about integrating that into our decision making every single day. And that's a process that we've started and it's a process that we continue on. Um, and that is the work for us as a leadership team at the organisation and us, uh, the board, and also this group to integrate sustainability into our work. Finally, the opportunities. It's right back on there about how we integrate it into our decision making. Um, this concept of water as a taonga or water as a treasured resource, I believe that's one where we can support Aucklanders and support ourselves to achieve the outcomes because it really is something that is incredible, that is limit, that has some finite components to it, and that water care is just on one part of the journey of looking after it. 
There's opportunities for more nature-based solutions. I've talked about a couple of today, um, but I think there's more opportunity for us to use nature as a friend to achieve the outcomes that we have. And healthy waters do some fantastic work in this already. And we've already started those conversations about additional collaboration with them to see what they, um, to see the learnings that they have for us. The last two are just about being making smart decisions. Even though we have uncertainty, even though we're not sure exactly what the world will look like, we do may, need to make decisions today with the type of organisation they are. And we should make those decisions, especially on climate, with a mindset that we want to be proud of them. We want our engineers to be considering that we should be proud of the decisions that we make every single day when they're looked back on in 30 and 50 years to make sure that they were the right ones for our organisation and for our city. So thank you so much. Um, it's a whirlwind tour and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, this, is, this is still just a snapshot and I couldn't include um, everything. But um, for me, Watercare has an incredible opportunity and we do an, 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 some amazing work. Um, we are linked to the natural environment every single day and our people work for Watercare because they believe that. Our people tell us that they work for Watercare because of the role that we have in supporting Auckland, Aucklanders and the beautiful um, environment that we have. So thank you so much for your time. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Chris. And um, yeah, a whirlwind tour of, of many, but not all of the uh, amazing things you are uh, all doing at Watercare. And uh, um, many of us, a big group of us, came to visit the Mangari uh, treatment plant. Was it this week or? Tuesday, yeah, this week, um, and, and saw and heard um, many of the things you've been speaking about in action. And I think a lot of us, uh, despite knowing what you all do, you know, seeing it and um, you know, seeing the tremendous work all the staff and contractors are doing, it's it's pretty phenomenal. So thank you all uh, for that. Uh, there was quite a number of questions, so we'll just head straight to them. Councillor Casey, you are first up. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, there's nothing like being there. And I was with the party on Tuesday with the deputy mayor that. Um, did the grand tour, and it was it was really exciting. And, and one uh, one of your biggest secrets, I think, is the redevelopment of Pukitutu Island. And it's a, I've got a couple of questions about that for you. Um, since I've been back, I had a few questions myself, and a few questions from others about, about the science of it. And I think we're underselling it online. I think there's a real opportunity there to to tell the story. My question, though, is. Um, when I came back, I realised it had a Maori name from um, local iwi, Timotu Ahiaroa. And I don't see that in anything that, um, that, that, that Watercare does. So uh, can we use the joint name? Is, is that possible? Or can we use the Maori name? Because that's also possible. So it was just that that was my question. I didn't know about it till I came back and somebody asked me. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I agree it's a, a bit of a hidden secret out there. Um, and the... Though the process to start that project was pretty in-depth and the relationship that we had to start with Iwi to, to give us the permission to, to rehabilitate the island the way that we were doing um, was one and included, including the, the, re, the naming um, for sure. Um, I don't have the answer for you today about the more use of the name, but I can talk with the team and our communications um, about it. Uh, I don't see any problem why, why we wouldn't. Thank you. We also got a bag of fertiliser each. Oh! <laughs> Good, thank you, Councillor. Well um, Deputy Chair Pipakum. Kia ora, Mr Chair. Um, Morena Koto, tēnā koe. Chris, thank you for that really informative presentation and I was fortunate as well to be along for the tour, which was very eye-opening and really fantastic. So it was great to be there on Tuesday and just echo what Councillor Casey said about um, the rehabilitation of um, Pukitutu Island. Um, my question is around, um, we, as part of our tour, we also got a presentation on some of, some of the innovation that Watercare is looking at. And I can't remember exactly what it, it was called, but it was basically on-site um, wastewater, like localised wastewater systems, kind of like sewerage mining almost, I think it was some reference like that. Um, but I just wondered, does that, it was a question that I had on Tuesday, but we ran out of time, but has that got the potential to be as disruptive as, say, distributive energy generation um, and what's happening there with um, the energy sector? Is there kind of disruption happening in water, water wastewater? I mean, you did talk a lot about not having to build infrastructure, but are we getting to a position where even like big pro projects like the Central 
interceptor were maybe conceived and developed at a time where we should be thinking about how the whole sector is going to be really disruptive and what does that mean for the future? Mm, thank you. Um, the, the opportunities in any circularity component are pretty exciting in the, in the water sector globally. Uh, and wastewater reuse has been a, a, an opportunity that's been identified um, in a number of different ways, often, however, at a big centralised um, in a big centralised way, and the Australians um, and the Americans in particular have been looking at wastewater reuse for drinking, for, for potable consumption. Um, and the way that they've been doing that has been f at big centralised plants, big infrastructure that has its own environmental impacts, and this is that balance that we talk about. Um, the more decentralised component, especially in wastewater, um, is when we look at that, I think about different cascades of water quality and at the moment we treat almost everything to drinking water standards and then use it for absolutely everything even if it's watering a sports field or even if it's in the nursery or even if it's um or, yeah or even if it's flushing the toilet right we, we use everything to drinking water standard so i think the potential disruption that you that you're alluding to um is around the consideration of water in different cascades of quality and the opportunities where that could be localized and um, one of the projects that we're investigating at the moment is the Rosedale sports fields. Fortunately, it's sitting right next to our, one of our wastewater treatment plants, but there's other opportunities where you have um, something smaller, just like a sewer, main, a sewer main, where you can sewer mine, like you're saying, with a smaller packaged treatment plant um, and create a quality of water that I wouldn't say it's up to drinking quality standard, but can be used for something like irrigation of a sports field. Um, the Alignment with renewable energy, solar for example, um, there's similarities, but there's also some significant differences in the way sun shines versus water flows. So I haven't seen the pace of change that we've seen in, the, um, in renewable energy. Um, but I think the ability for smaller packaged plants, the, the technology is improving um, in comparison to what we've done, done before. Um, another example of that that we've, we've worked with um, with the north um, around packaged water plants where we didn't have to bring in a whole, we didn't have to build a whole new treatment plant, you could bring in a containerized system. So those things are definitely starting to occur, um, not yet at the household level like solar perhaps, but probably a couple of steps before. Thank you, there's lots to explore there. <laughs> Namahi. Thank you. We have seven uh, more members to question, so I might have to cut it off there, but we'll go to Member Wilson. Kia ora Chris, Thank, thanks very much for the presentation, nothing like some energy uh, to get us all going, although it didn't sound like it this morning. Look, just a couple of things, um, the, the presentation where you utilise um, Māori reo and then not demonstrate it through the presentation is just really a bit disconcerting. Um, I probably think uh, if, if you are, you, you need to have a, an advisor, um, so that's just to help, um, so your presentation's got that, that complexity. So to describe what a care call YO, uh, you wouldn't normally do that. To describe what a care um, as kaitiaki, I think you find we would find that quite disturbing, that you're, you're doing that in terms of sustainability. So that I, I, I'm just giving you some... Um, some pointers, I guess. Um, we sit here as independent Māori stat board and we are looking for those sorts of things. Um, then te tāruke, a tāpiri, which is the climate change plan, as you're aware. be really good to see how you're linking that in too, because it is the plan Auckland Council is, is adhering to, how you're linking that to the sustainability um, for water care, because I, I wasn't able to see that accurately. Um, then you, you talked about the combination, the figures, I can't remember the slide number, unfortunately. You combine Rosedale and Mangere, um, and you were talking about 50% operational um, and 40% construction. Be really good to tease out those facilities so you can see how it impacts in terms of Mangere, which I understand percentage wise takes most of the waste um, as it. As it uh, combines with Rosedale, how much does that take? Uh, because from a perspective of, I suppose, southerners, it always takes the bulk and has done for many years. 
what are you going to do in this space in terms of sustainability? Uh, you use the word decouple. Decouple those so we can clearly see uh, who will have the most adverse impact. Um, and then uh, you, you did talk about decoupling and I wasn't quite um, sure of what you meant about that, so I'll pose the question now and then just move on to, to other comments. The, the question I have, you, you, you talked about something well, that sounded quite significant. Uh, we need to look at decoupling, balancing water security and discharge consent requirements. Wow, that seemed to be um, pretty uh, concerning for me as risk. So I'll leave that there to cogitate in your head. While I move to the others, you talked about the Monaco Harbour, uh, who um, most of you would consider as the most, um, the water quality is the worst, but you talked about the biodiversity I think those need to be balanced up in terms of sustainability, and you're matching it across. You talked about uh, Te Motu Ahi Aroa, which is Puke Tutu Island. You're calling um, mounds of excrement maunga. I, I, I can honestly say without a shadow of a doubt, you don't call mountains of uh, Tamaki Makoto citizens as a maunga. It has a really distinctive significance for iwi. Um, and in terms of uh, describing the the positive sides, yeah, there was a positive side, as we know, but that came was born by uh, a matter of litigation, so not everybody wanted that there. I think we need to keep those in perspective in terms of incorporating all the things I've, I've said. Uh, Y8 clearly is the most significant Y claim for any iwi up here in Tāmaki Makoto, how that contributed to the Monaco Harbour and the iwi associated with that. Um, so those are just commentary to hopefully aid and probably bringing your advisor in as well. But I really would like to understand the decoupling scenario, please, if I can. I know it sh should be short and sharp because there's lots of speakers, but can you just explain that really? There seems to be a risk there that hasn't really been identified. If we could get some more information later, that would be also. Cool. Thank you very much for the comments. Much appreciated. Um, the decoupling comment was specifically around growth. So traditionally, we've been on a linear growth of emissions in line with our growth in population. We know that population is continuing to grow, especially in Auckland. So we need to find a way to decouple the growth in emissions from that so that the emissions can decrease whilst the population increases. I think the, um, the second point, though, w was about the balancing um, component of water security, resource consents, and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that wasn't a decouple, that was a balance in our consideration of how do we ensure that we can achieve um, our greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, a 50% reduction in emissions, whilst we're getting, whilst we're requiring more water for the city and the emissions associated with more water because of the, the lower emission sources, the dams that we've had for many years have all, been, have all been used. So the question is, how do we ensure that we can achieve both outcomes and balance any of those impacts? It might mean more investment. It might mean a change in approach. It might mean something else, and that's the balancing equation that we have to have in all of our work. Thank you. I won't hold any more time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Kia ora, Member Wilson. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Councillor Walker. So, um, a few things. Um, one of the um, uh, suggestions and questions I've put uh, to successive meetings around uh, water care is joining up with water sensitive cities, um, which is an international network, um, South Pacific based in uh, Melbourne. I visited them. They're certainly up for it and it would significantly enhance our benchmarking. Are we making some progress there? Thank you very much for the question. Yeah, the Water Sensitive Cities Group has been engaged. The benchmarking um, is anticipated to occur in September. The, the dates haven't been set. Watercare is a, a component part because it's a city benchmark, not a utility benchmark. So it's been run out of um, the team that's delivering the water strategy for, for council. And Watercare is engaging with that. Um, one thing that has been recognised as, whether, um, as the team has engaged with the, the benchmark is that it needs a bit of tweaking for the New Zealand context and talks about indigenous water concepts, but they're probably not New Zealand indigenous water concepts. So that's, that's the, the status update from my understanding, but um, not my lead on that one, sorry. And just further to that, are we also engaging with um, 
Auckland University. Um, uh, I mean, for example, in Australia, you've got a partnership with Monash um, University. Usually there's some form of involvement like that. So have we had some discussions with them? For the benchmarking specifically or in general? The, the engagement of water sensitive cities. Through, through the chair, I'll take that. Um, so that's being led out of um, my area. I, I don't know the answer. I'm happy to come back to you, Councillor Watson. Uh, Walker. And just the other general um, question. Um, quite obviously, there are various um, scenarios, um, one of which is um, zero emissions by 2050. Given a circumstance where our present targets are probably nowhere near adequate enough, and that reflects the recent IPCC report and, and other information. Do we have a um, scenario-based uh, planning that allows us to bring a number of um, solutions forward? And is the general listing around things that you're looking at um, available um, so that you know we've got roadmaps across a number of areas? Thank you. The, um, the challenge associated with the most recent IPCC report is a stark reminder of the ambition we need to have. Um, two questions there. First one, um, will we have the, uh, well, second one was, will we have the roadmap um, for you to see? Not yet, um, not yet there, not yet um, in place, but that will be part of the SOI response that we have, will be a projection of how we tend to achieve our short term, but also our long term targets. Um, second question, remind me of the second question. Second question just went to the roadmap in terms of identifying the specifics of what we could be looking at. Mm. But just going back to the roadmap, it's not available now. What's your time frame around when we're going to have that? The time frame is aligned with the SOI. Um, our SOI target asks us to have that um, drafted by March next year to be presented into our SOI for reporting by September next year. I think your other question was around the perhaps what I would term maybe unconstrained thinking, and are we able to achieve these net zero targets if, with the new information, should should we be bringing them forward? Um, one of the pr three principles that I've asked um, the decarbonisation team to consider one is unconstrained thinking to begin with, so a bottom up approach. Uh, the second one is how do we have a bold ideas, just have that as a as a concept, and the third one is what would it take to get to net zero. Just, just at the highest level, what would it take to get to net zero? That, I don't have the answer for that yet, um, but then we can work backwards to see how we would achieve that. The last question, quickly, you mentioned Fonga Praa. Uh, both myself and Councillor Watson have an abiding interest in the Hibiscus Coast and that area generally. would be happy to engage with you around that. Thanks. Thank you. Good. And yeah, just on that water-sensitive cities uh, part there, we could get uh, Toby to update you um, directly. There is, yeah, there, there is a lot of work going on behind the scenes because it has been noted by uh, Manafini or Kaitiaki Forum and, and IMSB members that it is not an appropriate system to just throw into the, the Tamaki context without putting a bicultural te ao Māori lens over it. So we're working in, uh, looking for meetings, There's, I don't know if they've been set up yet, but to ensure that we are doing that in the correct way, because it's not appropriate just to throw an okay. international context into the time. I don't understand that, um, but if someone can explain that to me, there are multiple cities with indigenous relationships that are members of water-sensitive cities. So It's not saying we won't be involved with that, it's just not appropriate to put it the exact framework without acknowledging that we are completely different and that it needs to be uh, Māori-led, not international led when it comes to water. So, there, yeah, there's a lot bit of work to be done. Uh, Councillor Simpson. Uh, thanks, Mr Chair. Geez, Chris, I could speak to you all day. That was fantastic. Well done and congratulations. Look, I'll keep it brief. There's a number of um, questions. Is there um, such a thing as the head of sustainability group between other CCOs? Do you guys meet on a regular basis? Because I, I believe that you led the... Uh, Watercare led the 40-20-20, and I think that's a really great initiative. And I just wondered how much you share and build from each other and provide ideas. We've put it in all our CCO SOIs, and I know some of that is challenging, but you have to aim high, right? And I'm just keen if, you know, in the working group, is there, is there such a thing as a working group and how much you um, collaborate together around that? 
thank you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be part of the council family um, and the, the incredible sustainability managers that sit across a number of the of, of the CCOs um, and the parent body. Um, regular meetings to occur. Um, I hate to say, it, since Alec Tang left, we've been a little bit in a lurch, um, so we've got to get that get that back up and running. Um, so, and we were just talking about that um, last week. There was an email chain on it, so I don't have the next meeting in um, in my diary, but I can assure you that that group does exist and does collaborate frequently. Oh, fantastic. And just my last question, maybe through you or through um, staff beside you. I, I really enjoyed, like the others, the visit through the Mangari um, treatment, uh, uh, wastewater treatment um, processing <coughs> plant and the use of light and the other way, you know, sustainably actually what you are doing out there. I wouldn't mind going to see Rosedale. I think that the, um, the new pilot program you've got there with that um, solar panels that sit on 3% of the pond doing 20% of the work. I think that's a, a great initiative and I think that's something we would all benefit from having a look at and understanding how that works. So thank you. Sure, no, thank you, Councillor. And yes, there, um, to Chris's point around Alec and uh, Matthew and team are doing an amazing job, but where they are half the size they were a year ago with about 10 times um, the amount of uh, things to be doing. So they're recruiting at the moment, but it's pretty um, tough to cover over everything we're doing, but also all the government submissions and things that are coming in. Mayor Goff. Yeah, thank you very much, Chris, uh, for your presentation, which was really good. Um, when the drought first struck in 2019, Watercare acknowledged to us that they hadn't incorporated uh, climate change into their long-term water availability modelling. I'm just wondering, are you doing that now, and how are you doing it? And if so, what does it show? Thank you, Mayor Goff. Um, there is a tool that we use, I ECCM, the Integrated Source Management Tool. Um, and the tool has had um, been going through some updates recently. And the first update is make sure we've got the most recent information in it. So the last 20 years are as up to date as possible. And the next step, which has just started recently, is to ensure that we have the projections into the future. Now, that is the complex tool that we use every every single day. That doesn't mean that um, because it's not in that tool, we don't take into account those considerations. And the in the 14 portfolios, water source or water water availability is um, is one of them specifically on its own standalone. So an important area for us to focus on. So sorry, just to clarify that, are you? Have you now built climate change into that model? Because you, you hadn't two years ago, but you were um, hopefully intending to. Yeah. Um, so I understand you've got this integrated source management tool, but I still wasn't clear whether climate change was uh, an integral part of that. In the tool itself, it's not the model doesn't yet include the information, but it's being integrated as a project as we speak. Uh, are there plans to to bring that in? Because I mean, obviously, this is a pretty as as you pointed out in your presentation, that's pretty critical. Yeah, the 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 project um, is in flight. Yeah, I don't have the end date. Sorry, it's probably that. Yeah. For sure. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Deputy Mayor Cashmore. Yes, yeah, sorry and humble apologies for being late, Chris, but. Um, I really enjoyed what I saw, and, and again, thank you for Waterkeys Hospitality on Tuesday. It was much appreciated. We all learned a considerable amount. Very simple question. Your business is about pumping water or waste, either directions. What has the biggest whole of life carbon footprint? Steel pipes, polyethylene lined steel, or straight polyethylene? CLS, Cochrane Lined Steel Pipe, is our um, is, the, is the biggest individual source contributor from, from a pipeline's perspective. Um, it's a relatively traditional concept and, and tool that we use um, and there's opportunities for reduction both in the concrete, the steel um, and the opportunity for alternative alternative pipes. Thank you and last we have Member Wilcox. Thank you for your presentation. I've just done a quick algorithm here. Um, 780 litres of fuel for your diesel truck um, uses creates the same amount of energy as one ton of coal. If you're adding a truck a year to our electricity system, which is now using one million tons of coal every quarter, 
how are we reducing our carbon footprint? Thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> the, regardless of the one truck, whether it's this truck, another truck, or, or any other truck, um, the studies uh, that I've seen show that an electric vehicle um, is more efficient in its transfer of energy regardless of the energy supply that it's on and will reduce emissions. So even if you happen to be in Australia with one of these trucks, with the supply, well, energy supply that they have, the reduction in emissions because of the efficiency of the transfer of energy for the, for the electric engine is more so than the wastage associated with an internal combustion engine allows it to be more efficient than if it was a diesel engine. I suppose my question is really, if we're adding a tonne of coal a year, a tonne of coal every three months, or, or we're doing a million tonnes now, how is increasing that demand on our electricity consumption going to reduce our, our climate, you know, our, our carbon footprint? Because I'm really struggling with this part because we just we seem to be transferring from one mode to another mode, but we're actually not doing anything different at the at the source of the of the of the fuel, irrespective of whether mm. electricity is cheaper or not. Um, so you know, I'd like to see that work out, because as we put more load on the electricity system, we actually need not one million tons of coal every quarter. We'll need one million tons of coal every every month. Mm. I'll, I'll decline to comment on New Zealand's energy system, but I will pick up your point, which is really well made, about a hierarchy of reduction. And transitioning from one fuel to the other, such as that example, is not at the top of the hierarchy and isn't the first thing that you should, you should look to achieve. Just like you've suggested, if we cannot have any fuel, electricity, diesel, whatever it might be, then that is absolutely, absolutely the priority. And that goes back to the, the consideration of do you build in the first place? How big do you build it? What size do you need, et cetera, et cetera, so that we don't need to have as much as many inputs to achieve um, to achieve that outcome. Um, ideally, we don't need the truck in the first place, regardless of which, which fuel it might use. But a horse still. <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora. Um, good question, Member Wilcox. I think I have been looking at a similar uh, situation. Largely, the, the coal use for energy in New Zealand isn't used for the the charging of batteries is used for energy for industry rather than that then so it's, and we because of the hydro dams um, issue we have been increasing coal but actually now that the dams are full again we're, we're back to over 80 percent um, of renewable energy so um, but like Chris said that I had had a lot of questions about this around electric vehicles is that yeah the the reduction in emissions from cars outweighs the use, even if you are charging on coal energy, which we aren't in New Zealand anyway. But yeah. The, thank you, Chris. Um, I, could I have a mover? I think Desley indicated that she um, wanted to move. I'm happy to second. Um, thank you very much. I don't know if there's any uh, speaking turns, but yeah, you answered those um, questions well, but all the, also a huge amount of information. I guess more information, the better. Um, it is always good. So thank you very, very much, and we will see you uh, next time. So thanks, Chris. Um, any other speaking to the item? No? All those in favour? Aye. 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 Thank you. Right. Thank now, you. members, we will move to item nine. And apologies uh, that it didn't come out at the same time as the agenda originally, but I think we've all had... Um, enough information on this. So we will um, have Robert and Xuning and I think Greg and Wayne. Wait, everyone who come, everyone come up who wants to come up and then um, maybe <laughs> introduce yourselves as you get there and your role. Anyone is welcome. Cool, I'll just get you to introduce yourselves and your role in the organisation. Tēnā koutou katoa, I'm Zini Ui uh, from the Transport Strategy Team at Auckland Council. 
Marina Greg Nelson from Auckland Transport. I head up the transport sustainability area and I'm working with Ning on this pathways work. Marina Wayne Donnelly, I'm Deputy Chair of the Auckland Transport Board. Kia ora koutou, Abby Reynolds, Director of the Auckland Transport Board. Thank you, and Shannon, kia ora. So I just have some um, a brief summary of the report itself and also the recommendations that we're putting forward. Um, so in terms of the work, this work has been signaled to previous planning committee resolutions, so one in March this year and another one in June this year. Um, the Transport Emissions Reduction Plan will give effect to Te Taruke Atafari, Auckland's climate plan, which the Council endorsed in 2020. Te Taruke Atafari includes uh, commitments to halve our regional emissions by 2030 and also transition to net zero emissions by 2050. And the plan includes a model decarbonisation pathway that has a 64% transport emissions reduction goal by 2030 for Auckland. Um, in terms of the um, um, approach that we're taking, uh, this has been jointly developed by um, Auckland Council and Auckland Transport. Um, we are um, the key elements of this approach is essentially to identify the key interventions that are required to reduce transport emissions for the region um, and also to size the scale of those impacts. So we'll be looking at existing work that's already been undertaken by central government, um, literature review, business cases, uh, case studies from comparator cities um, to uh, inform the evidence base that we're building. Um, and we will be looking not just at transport interventions, but the other interventions that have an impact on transport, so land use being an example. Uh, and we'll be using the Avoid, Shift and Improve framework that covers a comprehensive range of interventions. Um, once we have the evidence base, we will be combining different programs of interventions together at different scales to identify the pathways that are required to get us to the 2030 target in Te Taruke Atafari. And, um, and an important element after that would be to assess the various impacts of those pathways, so social, economic, environmental, cultural, financial impacts. Uh, the assessment criteria hasn't been set yet, but we are expecting that it would include um, um, priorities that are important for council and Auckland transport, uh, road safety, public health, access, transport affordability, etc. Um, we also note that the Auckland Transport Board will be uh, um, endorsing the proposed approach in their August board meeting and will be um, delegating members to form part of the Transport Emissions Reduction Plan, uh, sorry, Transport Emissions Reference Group. Um, so which brings me to the next point, which is that we are seeking that the, a transport emissions reference group is set up that will provide direction to staff who are undertaking this work and who will uh, ad adapt the proposed approach as required um, and approve a recommended pathway for endorsement by the Environment and Climate Change Committee and the AT Board um, sometime in the second quarter of next year. In terms of the composition of the group, I think you've got it up there. Um, we are recommending that it includes the chair and deputy chair of the Environment and Climate Change Committee, the chair and deputy chair, deputy chair of the Planning Committee, the chair and deputy chair of the CCO Oversight Committee, uh, the chair and deputy chair of the Independent Maori Statutory Board, uh, two, members, two members from the Mana Whenua Kaitiaki Forum, and as well as three members from the AT Board. Um, we recommend that a terms of reference is uh, drafted and signed off by the reference group that will reflect the shared outcomes and joint approach that we'll be taking for this work. And in terms of next steps, um, we are um, meeting with the Mana Whenua Kaitiaki Forum uh, next Thursday to seek their advice on how they would like to be involved in the development in uh, of this work and also invite them to nominate members to um, be part of the reference group. Um, the AT board is um, looking at the proposed approach uh, at the end of August. Um, we are aiming to provide a progress update to the Environment and Climate Change Committee in December. Uh, the government is releasing its emissions reduction plan by the end of the year and we are hoping to come back to the committee with a recommended pathway sometime uh, in the second quarter of next year. Thank you. Perfect summation, Janing. <laughs> thank you um, very much. Before we um, move to the item, I think, was it Deputy Chair um, Wayne Donnelly, you would like to speak to it as well? I, I'll just move what is up there. 
and Deputy Chair um, Pepper Coombe will second, and then we'll go to questions after Wayne has spoken. Thank you. Thank you. I might get my colleague, um, Abby, to talk to you as well, because uh, this is her area of expertise rather than mine. My comments really are addressing what's in front of you in terms of governance and program and things like that. Um, uh, the AT board wants to make the strongest possible con contribution to this um, to this task. So thank you for the opportunity of being here today. The governance structure and the general approach is supported by the board. Uh, we will look at it more formally on the 26th, but the discussions we've had, we think it's very much on the right path. But there are a few points we would like to make uh, for the consideration of the reference group and this committee as that as this work gets underway. If I can bore you a little bit with some history, it's 50 years ago I joined the Auckland Regional Council as a, as a, as a, a new engineer on, um, on, on Robbie's rail plan. I was the second FTE on that team. So obviously it was all too little too late and we're still trying to build the thing. Um, those 50 years of involvement, I've been in touch with many large project, uh, large um, transport initiatives. And in my mind combined, they, they pale into insignificance compared to the task ahead of us over the next 10 years. In the Herald today, there's a report that says a 7.6% reduction in New Zealand emissions in, in, in the, the 2020 June quarter. There was a 7.6% reduction for that quarter. That required level four lockdowns and border closures to achieve. So it gives you a sense of the scale we're involved in here. And I think the, the, the first, the board's first um, area that we think perhaps should be looked at again is the scale is not quite being recognised but um, in this. I think our second area is the one of applied resources. It, it, it's, it, it does appear to us that we're going to rely on our best and busiest people to do this alongside their day job. I compare that to the resources being applied to the Auckland Light Rail Establishment Unit, which is doing a lesser task in the same time frame. And I do wonder whether we're setting ourselves up to not quite get there without that thinking. The board's other area of um, concern is, is the apparent belief that referring the results of this process to the current planning and planning and funding framework, which includes the RLTP, will bring about the impl implementation at pace. Um, those documents, certainly in my view, are inadequate and too narrow for the task. And I, and I do think we should be thinking more in terms of perhaps an Auckland Emission Reduction Empowerment Bill passed with urgency that so we can act with pace on the basis of what you're going to learn out of this um, process. Again, I emphasise the board hasn't discussed that, but of the, of the few discussions we have had, these are the points we, we bring out. I think our fourth area uh, of, of concern is, is that if we have too an earlier, early focus on impacts, that might close down options that could be effective in reducing emission. So rather, we would urge that the reference group, and I think this committee in particular, should see mitigation of impacts as an integral part of the solution rather than barriers to, um, to uh, options to reduce emissions, emissions initially. It's just a tweak to the process I think I'm talking about here. Um, now, Abby is already working with organisations that are addressing emission reduction, so I'd just like her to share a couple of comments with you before we pass on. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Um, so my background is uh, previously I was the Executive Director of the Sustainable Business Council and prior to that the Head of Sustainability for Vodafone and for Spark. I've spent the last 13 years working with New Zealand's largest corporates to help them think about sustainability and climate change is a critical piece of that. There are some things I've learned through that process of working with large organisations trying to lead this change. The first is that one of our single biggest barriers is our failure to be able to understand the scale of the transformation that we are going to be trying to lead. And that the longer we've left this, the harder and the more extreme that transformation becomes. And that's the situation I think we find ourselves in now. That it's actually really difficult for those people who haven't been working closely with this to understand how big the change is that we are going to need to make. I have a colleague who talks about the transition, the climate trans 
climate change transition as the single biggest driver of innovation since the Second World War. And if you think about some of the innovations driven by the Second World War, radar, you know, nuclear energy, that's the scale of change that we are likely to experience. So I guess one of my reflections for this group is to um, wonder about the constraints we have just simply because we're not able to conceive of how big this change is going to be, which is sort of emphasising the point um, that Wayne has made. The second is that the pathways are really critically important to address the first point. It's really difficult to understand how large this transition is until you actually understand what needs to be done. My hypothesis, based on my 13 years, is we are going to have to figure out every lever, every opportunity, and we are going to have to pull all of them. And I think the thing I also want to emphasise there is we are going to have to discover and think about and invent levers we haven't even thought of yet. That, for me, is one of the most exciting things about being part of this, and I also want to thank all of you for the huge privilege you've given me to be on the Auckland Transport Board. I love this, and I'm so thrilled to be able to be part of what is actually a hugely challenging time, but with some problems which I'd like to be part of solving. And part of that is how we are going to catalyse the innovation and cleverness that exists inside our organisations in order to bring them to bear on the series of challenges ahead of us. We need new thinking and new ways of working. If we do what we've always done, we will get what we've always got. And that's the other thing I've seen consistently from some of the large organisations I've worked with. They are thinking about this as an opportunity to be different to pivot around climate change as a way of bringing and unleashing innovation, particularly with the youngest people inside their organisations. I think the final point I'd emphasise as well is we spend a lot of time talking about impacts. We need to get really comfortable starting to talk about the cost, but we need to talk about the cost both of doing this and not doing this. There's no more business as usual. That's become so clear from the IPCC report that came out this week. There are two futures. We get this done and it's bad. We don't get it done and it's very much worse. There's a set of costs on either side of that and we need to start being able to acknowledge and recognise that. So one of the conversations I know we will be having as a board is having to start to factor in the costs of both the climate change mitigation, the adaptation and the transition costs which are associated with this. So I bring that as a kind of perspective from someone who's been working in the space and feels urgently the need for action on this. Let me tell you, the climate change emergency that you declared, I take personally and seriously. And I look forward to working with you all on it. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Abby. And Greg, did you have any further points? Or? Yeah. I can't compete with those two. So no, nothing to add. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Henderson, questions? Thanks. We've got a few, Chair, if that's OK. Um, I think fundamentally one of the most important questions for us is how are we bringing the public on this journey? Um, I'm a now veteran of the Innovating Streets situation and I understand that the community are not quite where we are at on this situation and we are at not where we need to be either. So we're behind. The community don't understand in, in many pockets why we need to do some drastic stuff that's actually going to inconvenience people. So I guess my first question is, how are we bringing the public on this journey? I think we know that through the endorsement of Te Tarukia Tafri and the consultation processes that was done as part of it, and also subsequent um, plans like the long-term plan and the RLTP is that the public does want climate action to be undertaken, and there was a lot of support for Te Taruki Atafari's um, climate commitments. In terms of the, um, when, to, when you start looking at individual street streets and areas, I guess that's where some of the um, conflict might emerge. But I think it's important to note that that is a natural part of the process, and it's only, only once you start connecting these interventions together so that they form part of a system, a safe and connected network, that you will start seeing the benefits. So I think um, as part of this work, we are recommending that there is a um, public communications uh, campaign that is rolled out as part of the development of this work, um, broader than just what is required in the transport space, but um, the kind of whole of systems change that is required to address our climate um, crisis, um, but that requires um, funding to do that. Okay, thanks. I might reserve my right to speak on just that point. Um, I've got several other questions, Chair, but I'll try and be quick. Um, 
In terms of management of this kaupapa, this could present essentially a different transport future for the whole of Auckland. And that's a huge conversation. That's bigger than the conversations that we have around here on a regular basis. So my question is, why do we need a reference group for this work as opposed to workshopping this with all members of the committee? Because we all have a stake in this. Through the how about I, I'll I'll give that a go. Um, so, what we're really looking for in, in so many of our projects is a is a smaller group um, and smalls relative. This is reasonably large, but it's certainly um, smaller than this whole committee. We do need a smaller group to be able to assist us in direction and and just making sure we're on the right track. It's not about excluding this committee or, or the AT board, for example, or anything like that, but it is getting representatives to help us do the work. It just becomes um, unwieldy otherwise. Having said that, though, um, I'm, I'm looking at Ning and Greg. Um, there will be opportunities for us to either give uh, updates or um, opportunities to workshop, things like that, which we will um, absolutely do with this committee and happy to do that. We just think it's a little more practical to have a smaller group. That's all in terms of directing the work on a kind of a month-to-month -month basis. And what, what I would add, given the numbers that we have, currently we have coming back to this committee in December. Um, I think that a key role for the reference group is to decide should there be more frequent um, engagement with this group and what the nature of that engagement should be. I think that's the best approach. If I could, Mr. Chairman, uh, in my experience of this kind of venture, it's very useful to have an agile um, governance group that helps things tick over. And one of its key functions is to flush out the bigger discussions that need to come back to this this group for guidance. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I think the structure works uh, for those reasons, and it's not about taking away any decision making from from this committee, it's just about facilitating those who have to do the work, keeping them on track, and elevating the stuff that needs to be elevated. And and the the frequency with which that happens will fall out of the process. Yeah. Okay, I might might have a quick word on that one as well because I also point out that there's no one from West Auckland on that group, and that's the highest emitter per capita in Auckland. Um, still, I mean, for example, we just found that 91% of Henderson residents still use their car, and that has a train station in it. So that, that's a big issue. Um, and issue, Māori and Pacifica community is very high in that community. I don't want to be parochial Pete here, but I think that's just an important thing to raise. Um, but I have a different question as well. My last question, thank you, Chair. Um, so this plan is absolutely necessary, and, and I, I share your belief in this, um, but it will bring up potentially a very large price tag so I liked the suggestion on potentially an act of parliament to try and solve the issue. But my question is essentially, how are we going to handle the financial situation that comes out of it? Because the community won't want a report that's totally unfunded. So how are we going to handle it? I'll try to answer that. Um, and maybe other people can supplement. Um, we know from the that there is going to be a uh, substantial investment that is required to support this work, but there are also ways of looking at our in existing infrastructure and its existing network um, that can help with reducing transport emissions that won't have such a big price tag. Um, we also know that the Climate Change Commission's final advice has recommended that the government provides a substantial increase to local government on public transport walking and cycling improvements, um, and this plan will help us uh, position us to, um, I guess, receive the funding that is required to, to do this work. If I could make a follow-up point, um, while we don't know what the plan is, we have no idea what the costs are going to be. So the conversation is extraordinarily difficult in terms of how, because we are going to need to speak to the government until we actually know what we need to do, what's the price tag. So that's why, at least from my point of view, having a really clear pathway is really critical. It helps us think about all of those things in a really holistic way. Yeah. And, and the other issue, <coughs> this group is not going to be, it was originally going to be called a governance group, and I asked quite clearly not to call it a governance group and to call it a reference group, because this uh, group will not be making decisions. This Everything will come back to committee, um, go to local boards for feedback, and then hear decisions. But also this will be the tool that influences the future RLTP, the future 
budgets, the future 10-year budgets. This is not going to suddenly drop out a whole lot of things that no one's had a debate or a say in. This is about trying to finally get the answers to the questions we've been asking when the RLTP comes up, when other things come up and we go, well, just reduce emissions. Actually, we've never really delved into what it looks like and if it, you know, so then at that point, this will help much like a health and safety plan or, or other things we've done that will influence decisions going forward. Uh, yeah. Councillor Young. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just two questions here. Is this work an uh, opportunity to review our current transport investment to ensure that we can get the highest emissions reduction? And my second question is, will this include the prioritizing rapid transit investment and the focusing on part of our city, which currently have the least public transport options? Thank you. Through, through the chair. Oh, huh? go, Jacques. No, you go. <laughs> um, uh, yes, like um, like everything we look at in climate change, because it's not obviously just about uh, transport, but this is what this particular work is. Um, yes, it will impact ultimately um, our investment in transport, uh, and that's some of the levers and things that the team have been talking to you about um, today. But we don't know the answers to that yet. Uh, and part of that, to your second question, is um, is one of equity or accessibility, however you want to frame that, about enabling people the choice to get around with, with different modes, particularly public transport. So again, that's all part of the package. There will be some change suggested that will come out of this, um, and then the conversations begin and decisions need to be made by this body and others about what that looks like and when. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Simpson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, great questions, Shane. Mm -hmm. um, I, my question is to you or to Megan around process. Look, I know that we have resolved to set this up and I'm, I'm supportive of that. I think the risk is that there, um, I think there's a risk that's missing from the west. I think there's a risk, of, I mean, you've got two central, you've got two south, and you've got two north, and you've got no one from the west. I don't know where Mana Whenua Kaitiaki Forum will come. I don't want to add people to this reference group, but my question is around process. I think it's really important that we have a workshop before you bring this back to a public committee. Because, mm. you know, I'm part of the governance of this region, and if this group come up with something I'm not happy about, I would rather have the opportunity to input that at a time and see whether that could be accepted rather than have a spat around this table. And I just think it's not if we have a workshop, I think we absolutely need to have a workshop. Um, so my question is, is that possible? And the second thing is, I want a little bit more clarity around the regular update from the reference group to us as a team. What do you think that will look like? Again, for the very fact that I just want to see where this is going. I don't want it to end in a point over there and all of a sudden it's gasp, you know? Uh, I'm going to answer the first question. The answer is yes. Um, they're absolutely... So we will come back to this um, committee anyway in December as we've um, referenced in the um, uh, resolutions, uh, but we will, we will, um, we will do uh, other workshops as well. Okay, so the answer is yes on that. I'm not sure if you've had thoughts around what um, reporting from the reference group might look like. I think that's something that um, should be discussed as part of the formation of the reference group and should be included in the terms of reference in terms of the frequency of the updates that they provide to the wider committee. So you want to put that in a... Um, in a would, would, do you need an additional resolution for that or do you... I mean, uh, in your in your hands, we will. So we will put that in the terms of reference around regular reporting back. We, I guess we just don't know what that looks like yet. So if you if you want to put that in there, it's you, you, you tell us. Think, okay. It, the, yeah. The, the other thing is that the December also. You know, we will be doing updates prior to our official committee. But even the December decision is an update before a final decision later yeah, next not... next year. So December will be like a. Uh, an official Progress. check, these are the things, you know, I'm assuming like these are the things, this is the direction, and then next year will okay. be the official 
um, you know, second quarter next year. So there's going to be quite a few touch points for everyone to to have a go. But remember, two uh, members, that this is this is all based on our support for unanimous support for Te Tāraki Te Tāwhiri, the um, the push for the Hikina Te uh, Te Kohupara um, submission. It's everything that we've already passed. And then now this is us trying to do the work of what of the decisions we've we've previously made. But I don't shy away from making sure that everyone is over this. It just means that they're trying to get even this group together for several meetings, maybe a, a month or by the end of the year, um, to try and get everyone. It may not be possible. Uh, Deputy Chair, Councillor Coon. Thank you, Kia ora Koto, and nice to see the um, Wayne and the Abbey alongside the Kaimahi. Um, great to have the directors here. I've got um, a question directed more to um, Auckland Council Ning and then one to, to Auckland Transport. Um, there's been a bit of discussion around the cost and you and it has been talked about um, the cost of not of inaction as well and the report doesn't really address that we're likely to have far more cost because we don't act. And I don't expect, I mean, I know that's a big bit of work to do that assessment, but is it something that is being looked at that we will have some analysis on the way through because I think we've got to get the equation right? Yep, definitely. So there will be, um, in terms of the development of the pathways, there will be one that is a business as usual pathway. So the assessment of the impacts of a business as usual pathway will include the cost of inaction. Right. Well, that's really good to know. Um, in terms of the the consultation and the report does talk about, you know, we had this incredible support for Te Taruki Atafuri. Um, we know we have to act, we've declared the climate emergency, but at the same time we've got this tension of um, the report sort of assumes that there's going to be extensive further consultation and I just would like to understand in terms of the recommendations that are likely to come back. When we've looked at how we went into COVID and declaring an emergency there, there wasn't time for extensive consultation about how we were going to act to that emergency. And we're getting to a point where we've got to, we're going to, you know, that's going without saying that we have to act as this, this is an emergency. So, are we going to be very clear as a reference group that, that what is going to come through the TERP is going to be actions that might not actually enable a, a process of extensive consultation because of what we actually have to do on the ground quickly? I'm going to respond on Ning's behalf. And I'm also going to respond to some of the other earlier questions. There, there's quite a bit of detail around this work that we haven't figured out yet, including how we engage with stakeholders, communities, et cetera, et cetera. So the, how we assess impacts, all of that. So the idea is that we will now start doing more detailed work, what that looks like, and take those as recommendations to the steering group for the steering group to give us some direction on that. Um, and that's how we will do it. Um, that will then obviously also include, do we um, have a general public consultation while the, in the development of the plan, or is that something that happens with its implementation? All of those kinds of things are the kinds of detail that we have to work through and bring to the steering group um, to give us some direction on. That will also include, that was, I was going to say that earlier, but um, in terms of the engagement of this um, committee, do we use workshops, more than just updates, that kind of thing? That was all the kind of detail that has to be sorted. And if I may, Mr Chair, I do just have two other questions that I just would like to draw out. And this one's directed at Auckland Transport, and I'd love to get your words that you read out there, um, Wayne. That was... I was trying to take notes, but there's some really good things there. I imagine that Lee Alton was the first employee of the um, light rail back in Robbie's time. He's made that he's made that claim, so maybe you, <laughs> he was the first and you're the second. But um, just about um, yeah. no, he, he said that when he um, took on the chairmanship. I've heard him say it at his at a public meeting. Anyway, sorry. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Oh, sorry to be a bit of a downer in terms of where Auckland Transport might be coming from, and it's great to hear the leadership and what you're saying, but within our report, um, we've got a regional streets for, for people fund criteria, and I have been told that this is going to be changed. But Auckland Transport managed to sneak in there, it's on our agenda, a criteria that is kind of contrary to what we're trying to achieve and anti what we're doing, and is making an unsupported assertion um, that has cropped up elsewhere. And I just feel like you know, there's an issue here about how we're going to bring the organisation along um, to really understand, you know, the, what we're trying to achieve and also the means by which we're doing it. And it, it, it's, you know, we might have to end up in a situation like the UK where the government has come in and said, you've just got to, you've got to do it in this way in terms of supporting low traffic neighbourhoods and all these interventions. So I just wanted to raise that as a, as a concern um, in terms of, how that can be, well, it's a question really as to how that how that's going to be, how we're going to bring the organisation along um, to really understand what we're we're trying to achieve in terms of reaching our emissions targets. You've caught me out. I know it's not on my radar at all that there's an issue. So come back to you on that. Is it? Um, as a relatively new director, one of the things which is really important about this plan is what it helps us do as governors is have a conversation about everything lining up behind the decarbonisation conversation. So at the moment, as an organisation, we're trying to meet lots of objectives, and I think we're doing a relatively good job of that. What this will give us is a really unequivocal plan that helps us understand all of the steps that need to be taken in order for us to get to the target. It kind of goes to my point about the scale of the transformation. Like At the moment, I, at, organisationally, I don't think we yet entirely know everything that's going to have to happen. This plan will help us do that, and I think that helps get everything behind what we're trying to do. So from my point of view, that's why I've been pushing really hard for this as part of the, my role as a governor. Thank you. Good to hear that. And I have had some reassurance that the criteria is going to be changed based on the feedback. So although it's made it onto the agenda, it shouldn't be there. Um, so, and lastly, Mr Chair, and this is more directed at you, I guess, in terms of this makeup of the reference group, and I know it's getting quite large, but also it does reflect that our regional roles, and with respect to, um, and with respect, Councillor Simpson, I guess there's quite a local board debate to say you've got to have the the you know north, south, east, west, and everybody represented geographically. Whereas this is an, this is an opportunity for us to really put our regional councillor hat on, and to be thinking about the skill set. So if there are skills miss missing, I don't think geographical representation is necessarily a skill that we need to have on there. But, um, you know, that this is where I absolutely <coughs> would want to take on this role in terms of have we got the right mix of skills from our committee roles and it's our opportunity to be regional councillors. So, be, I guess, Mr Chair, I'm, if you're, I'm comfortable with that makeup. If you're feeling that we've got that mix right, even though it does become quite a large reference group, you know, thank you for all those. I do appreciate that. I had a big chunk of questions, but yeah, appreciate I'll, it. I mean, I, yeah, I'll just take that as a, a comment, but I think the resolutions are up on the board. Um, uh, Councillor Philippine. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I will restrict um, what I'd be saying here as questions. My first question is how, um, where is it? Uh, how important is it that um, the demographic groups are a core focus of the implementation of the pathway? Um, how important are they? That's one question. We've talked a lot about cost and impact thus far, and, I, and so we'll answer your question. Um, when we're talking about costs, we're not talking about financial costs. We're talking about costs to the economy and society, and in society within different groups, be it based on gender or ethnicity. So we're looking at making sure we're covering all those different, different groups and the transport impacts. 
Yeah, because I'm not talking about costs. Just just to clarify that, it's it's around consultation with consultation. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, do you know who um, the demographics that we have within council report to? Do you know which committee they report to? I'm going to. I, I'm, I'm asking the staff the question. Sorry, Chair. I'm going to jump in there. Um, Councillor Filipino, you will see in the, um, there's a section in the report where we talk about the stakeholders that we need to engage on. Um, and one of the examples in that list of stakeholders, and again, that's not something that has been finalised. This is work that we do need to do more detail, and we'll come to the steering group on that. But, for example, we've included all our um, advisory panels. Um, because they are really key and they represent a whole. So there's an example of some of that kind of input that we need to get in terms of developing those pathways, not just implementation, but the development of the pathways to understand those impacts. So, so I'm, I'm assuming your answer is they report to the Parks, Art, Community and Events Committee. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Um, another question, and it's in regards to number 48. Um, you mentioned the um, the four well-beings in, in regards to, to number 48. Um, and, and you've said that the assessment is critical to selecting the best pathway for Auckland. Um, is that statement saying that any communication input from our community um, is, is the best pathway for Auckland in regards to this particular item? Um, sorry, I, I hope I um, understood your question, Councillor Filipina. Um, I guess as part of the um, development of the pathways, we will be getting input from, uh, as part of a targeted stakeholder engagement process, to get input from um, various advisory panels, uh, climate action groups, poverty action groups, to inform the development of those pathways. Um, and in terms of the impacts themselves, they will be looking at things that we can measure either quantitatively or qualitative, qualitatively that are important for Auckland that have been identified as part of other strategies and frameworks that we have. And so we'll be using those as our, I guess, uh, as guidance for how we assess those impacts. Let me know if I haven't answered your question. Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to, to, to make sure that it, it's around those four well-beings that you mentioned in number 48 and the assessment of those and the impacts and how important they are in regards to developing this particular um, agenda item. My, um, I've got two more questions through you, Chair. If you have a look at number 70, lack of community mandate for certain solutions, and it, it, it had Auckland Council, Auckland Transport, ability to implement these interventions may be constrained by factors including. Now, we know that the social impacts uh, that happen around our community, community are always being missed out. How important is it for this this agile group um, that is under D to ensure that doesn't happen? I'm going to take a punt here. Councillor Filipina, I, I think you're trying to make a point, and I'm hearing that, um, that there might be a omission on that list of who should be on the group because there are other committees who have a certain purview and represent certain groups. Um, so rather than try and answer that question, I'm just going to take the punt that that is where you're heading, and I'll say that on your behalf. Yep, and, and, and I'll just go one question, Chair, and that's it. Whose decision was it that uh, that is the makeup of this group? Is it Was it uh, staff, or was it um, the Chair, Deputy Chair, um, in regards to making... Uh, the appointments on this particular um, item? That was us. That was staff thinking about what that should look like, and um, hence I am more than happy to fess up. I hear what you're saying. Made a mistake there. Thank you, and I resume my right to speak. Thank you. Councillor Walker. I've just got one um, big question, and I completely support the comment that you made that we need to do everything. And what follows from that is our current process, which is around prioritisation and the like, really doesn't cut it. So in respect of what we need to do, if we assume that that has to involve foresighting and backcasting, scenario planning, what follows is that critically we need scenarios 
for our budget. So we don't just have a long-term plan that just has the one budget that is basically business as usual and incremental. And fundamentally, we're talking about a complete change in the way we do everything and everything here. Um, for example, as it stands now, on a project-by-project -project basis, we still are committing ourselves to projects that lock us into a high-carbon future. So I've got a, a real concern around our ability generally to be able to address these issues. I've been to the Yacht Cop um, conference, multiple conferences around this issue over decades now, and one of the observations that I make, certainly under this current term and the previous term, is that our council has actually become ever more introverted in respect of exposure to other cities, what they're doing. As a country, we're at the bottom end in terms of dealing with emissions, and as a city, much the same. So I just can't emphasise enough that it's not just a small change that we require. The very way we do things and we address things has to be brought into contention, and that involves us. And just what the answer to that is, I don't know, because I don't really see it being addressed. And I see all the processes as being business as usual. I see our decisions as being business as usual, on a project-by-project project basis, and when I raise these issues, I find that um, often there isn't the support around the table. So, that, so how can we address these issues? For example, Tokyo, you mentioned cities. Tokyo's got a cap and trade. It's a big city, more magnitude than us, but it has those tools. How are we going to address this structurally as it goes to Auckland Transport and Council? So I can address that from an Auckland Council point of view, which I think partly will also um, address it from Auckland Transport, but happy for Auckland Transport to respond directly. You um, provided some additional funding through the long-term plan um, for two things in particular. The one was around climate action. Um, you also provided some funding around the NPSUD implementation. Part of what that funding is helping us with is to create a, a whole new approach to how we look at growth, how we think about scenarios and giving us the tools and so therefore modeling tools and the skills to actually move into that space. Because um, having, for example, a growth model that is just here and now and today um, it simply does not cut it. So we are developing um, a whole new approach to growth modeling that really is scenario-based, that is far more responsive and that we can start giving you answers when you ask questions like that far more quicker. Um, and so that's how we're approaching that, setting up that expertise um, and ability to be able to do that. My, my question is that directed to you, Jacques, and more to the other people at the table. And further, when will we actually have a, a roadmap that's based on foresighting and backcasting and meeting zero by 2050, if not significantly earlier than that, because we're on worse track um, pathway as it stands now as a city? Uh, Councillor Walker, in my mind, um, I'd always hoped that this would be using forecasting and backcasting, because that those are the models that the corporates I've worked with have used to arrive at these conclusions. But I also think critically part of your point is about how we start to think and do some things differently. So one of the things that we would very much like to see this process embodying is um, a much more blue sky thinking approach to this. Like We need people to be able to come with their good ideas, which we may not previously have thought about. We need an environment and a way of working which makes it safe for people to have all of the ideas they might have. We need a way of engaging our young people and all of our organisations because that's where so much of the energy and the ambition for change is coming from. So I think this happens at two layers. One, the structural models you're talking about, and I think that's part of the plan. But the second is our ways of working as a reference group. We are going to need to be enabling um, a context where people can bring innovation and new thinking. And we might need to innovate the way we work together as well if we're going to do this differently. Uh, you know, one of the things I, th I think is going to be really important and will be really foreign is we might need to experiment and prototype some ways of working which we haven't used before. I think the scale of this challenge requires us to be thinking at all of those levels. Um, and that's one of the things which makes me excited and optimistic about this is that we are now forced to actually do some things differently. Thank you.
uh, Mia Goff. Um, can I just um, in, ask your indulgence, Mr Chair, to make a couple of comments around the questions that are coming up. Um, first of all, the, the understatement of this paper in Section 6 is that it will require difficult choices and substantial investment. That is a huge understatement. Just think for a moment what we're doing here. This will require the biggest transformation this Council has ever been asked to make. It will involve the toughest decisions we've ever been asked to make, and it will involve the highest costs we've ever been asked to impose on, uh, on our constituents. So let's just get that in perspective. I'm not saying that's a reason not to do anything. I think the intergovernmental the inter panel on climate change was absolutely clear. But I'm just finding it a bit weird that we're focused on the composition of the committee. On the latest proposals I've seen, it comes up to 17. Everybody but the mayor is on this committee and we're calling it a reference group. Well, there's a couple of others that aren't on it as well. Yeah, sorry, Fessel. Um, um, I, I, I think that if you're going to make it that big, you might as well just have the committee as a whole, plus Auckland Transport, plus our mana whenua representatives. But, but we're focused in the wrong area, is what I'm saying. This is absolutely huge. Uh, and I, you know, the, the public hasn't, you know, we've done all the easy stuff so far. The easy stuff was declaring a, a, an emergency, which it is. And the evidence is there, and we have to act, and it's going to cost us one way or the other. Let's put the cost up front and stop the damage rather than have the damage and then meet the same cost. So I'm, I'm not criticising that, but I am saying, please, when we're asking these questions, please focus on what's really bloody important about this paper, uh, and, it, and, and it is critical. Um, the questions that I have um, that I'd, I'd like commentary on. In terms of the recommendation, you know, obviously the critical thing is how do we go about getting a 64% reduction in, in, in our transport emissions? 64%. And B1 talks about identifying key interventions to do that, but nowhere do we actually try to quantify what this will cost. You know, we spent hours the other day debating over a million dollars. Um, we talk about Eastern Busway and the importance of that, that's $200 million. We're actually talking about billions of dollars in this, uh, and that's what we need to focus on. So my question, my first question, I'll, I'll ask them as a group, if I may, Mr Chair, um, is presumably, if you're gonna set this up as a separate group, and we have to make that as a, as a decision, um, you'll be wanting to try to quantify what the cost is. So that's first question. The second question is, um, we, we shouldn't exaggerate our importance in all of this. We are a council, uh, and the changes that need to be made need to be made nationally, and what we do has to be consistent with the government's emissions reduction uh, policy that it will bring out in December in response to the Climate Change Commission. But we, we need to ask the question, what share of these costs are properly met by council? and what are properly met by central government. Uh, doesn't really matter, actually. We're, we're all ratepayers and taxpayers, um, but, but somebody has 93% of the revenue and somebody has 7%. Uh, we happen to be the 7%. Um, what does this actually mean to, to the burden that we'll be placing on our, our ratepayers, and, and are they in a position uh, to, to meet that burden? That's a, that's a serious question. Um, and what... Uh, you know, I, I think Shane's question was a good one too. If this is a big burden, um, everybody says we've got to do more about climate change, right up to the point that they, you put the finger out and say, you. you are going to be paying for this, and you, meaning we, are going to be paying for it, and we have to pay for it. So maybe this reference group's also got to think uh, about how we get that message and convey that message and continue to work on that message with the public. Because, you know, I don't think we around this table get the implications of this, and if we don't get it, the public aren't going to get it either. So that's going to have to be spelt out. So those are... Or the other, the other question is, actually, how realistic is it that we can put the infrastructure in place in order to deliver that 64%? 
that's a that's a real question. The projects we're working on now, we know that they're, they're ten years in the planning, and we're going to take a huge group of people off the road and put them onto public transport. Are we going to be able to deliver that within the time frame? That's a that's a that's a serious question uh, as well. So. Um, there's one other, and it's just escaped my mind at the moment that I was uh, that I was going to ask about. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's that's underlying. Um, but maybe if if, if um, people at the end of the table could just comment on some of those things. But if I bring back to where I started, Mr. Chair, if we're going to have everybody on this reference group, um, there's little point in having a reference group rather than having the committee as a whole plus. Transport, Auckland transport is absolutely essential. Abby, it's great to have you on board. Thank you with your background expertise and, and Wayne with your institutional memory uh, and Mana Whenua are critical to this as well. But hopefully, you know, that's comment and question, but to try to put what we're doing today here in context. This is not big. This is huge. Comment? Shining? Uh, I will... I can't answer that, but I'm going to try. In terms of the cost, um, can't tell you what that is. Um, until we actually do the work, um, we won't know what those costs are. But the point you are making, this is not a little thing. This is fundamental transformation of the system and how we think and approach everything. So I, I think that's really the point you're making. Um, in terms of the cost, um, what we will try to do at this um, in developing the plan is start giving a feeling for it. Um, but I don't think that will, we will be able to quantify all of the costs exactly. What the pathways will do is look at this at a regional level. Um, the implementation is going to then come through at a more local level and the actual projects. The pathway itself um, will not necessarily delve into the detail of projects. It is what do you need to change and by how much to achieve the 64%. Um, the, the intention is that we do as much of that as we can, um, but I think a lot of that will actually play out once you have the plan. You understand the quantum of the change and the nature of that change. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, we'll be, be able to get the infrastructure in place. That's a certain part of the... Um, yeah, that's a good question. We will have a think about that. But remember, a lot of the solution here is not simply about putting more infrastructure in. It is also avoiding travel. It is... Yeah, so we seriously have to think about how do you change behavior to have less travel because it's the travel that requires the infrastructure. And it's going to take, I think Ning spoke or Abby maybe spoke about, it is going to take all of those levers. It is not just building more stuff or changing the nature of the thing you've built. It is how we think about and go about our business. It's a major part. Which then links to the last bit that I noted here, noted here is around the, how do we get that message across? Um, absolutely. Um, and some comments were made earlier about that. So that is part of the detail work that we will put some recommendations together to the group or the committee or however that ends up. Um, our thinking about what that might involve, when you might do that. Um, I don't think it is a one-off, let's do a six-week thing. This is probably an ongoing campaign and working with people, educating, helping understand. Um, so that will be part of what we put to this group on some of our thoughts and how to go about that. I'd just like to add some comments. Thanks first, Jack. Um, first on the communications campaign, one thing that we have to be really, um, really deliberate about is as we progress through this year, there'll be more communications from the central government around your emissions reduction plan for the country. And how can we time anything that we do to get benefit out of the communications we'll see from central government as well? We don't want to be left in a position where central government is taking all the, the share of voice, all the noise, and Auckland Councils and Auckland Transport aren't contributing to that. So it's a, a timing element there. Um, just on, yeah, so it's definitely beyond just infrastructure. One, th there's many tools. One tool is one that we know will have equity impacts, like road pricing. So we know about the congestion question. Um, we know that will give a, a small amount of emissions reduction. We know to get a significant amount of emissions reduction, it would mean quite a high price potentially on people using the road network. So it's how we reduce people traveling as well. 
and that's where it's critical that we quantify what the costs are of that on, on the Auckland society and on the economy. We won't be doing our job if we haven't answered the question, how do we get to the 64% reduction? So from my point of view, that's the thing. Yeah. What has to be true for us to get there? The second, I th the second thing that I think it's also worth just commenting on is one of the great dilemmas of climate change is it's the worst diet we've ever been put on. No flying, not so much driving. Some people will tell you stop eating meat, stop eating cheese, stop eating butter, all of that sort of thing. And one of the dilemmas in this space for all of us is that there is no one out there telling the compelling story about the beautiful future for Tamaki Makoto, for Aotearoa, as we decarbonise. And I think that's one of the things I'll invite all of you to wonder about. What's the picture you can paint for your communities? And we're going to need to start painting for all of them about how we create a compelling picture of a future that everybody wants to create with us. That getting on your bike is the sexier thing to do that um, catching public transport is what the cool kids do, that more working from home is the way we're going to roll. Part of our challenge in doing this work is finding a narrative that actually helps people make this transition. And that's been such a big gap nationally and internationally. You know, it's a really hard piece to do because it's so ephemeral. But I think there's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to start wondering about the picture that we can paint for our constituencies, which helps them make sense of this and makes it something that we can start to embrace and that they can start to create with us. Because part of what we are going to have to come back with you, back to you with, is a behavioural change plan. We are going to need to talk to you about what we are going to have to do to help people make this transition. Like, there's no question in my mind that we're going to have to spend money on that. So my invitation to all of us is to start wondering what role we can play in that. And I've heard some of it from some of you already, so I think there's great skills in this room to do it. And how do we, how do we up the ante on it? Uh, Mr Chairman, the, I remember the one thing I was going to ask, and, and uh, Abby just uh, promoted that. We talk about the co-benefits, which goes back to Shane's question about how you promote this, but the biggest, biggest co-benefit, if this works, will be totally reducing congestion um, because people aren't going to be driving around like they are now. So, you know, we worry about congestion at the moment. Uh, what what the reducing our emissions will mean uh, will be significantly reducing the number of cars that are on the road and that's the new future that uh, we would be looking forward to. And in that context too, coming back to infrastructure, we actually have a lot of infrastructure in Auckland that we use it for storing cars and driving cars. And, and I mean, there's a lot of conversion of use that should be able to happen under this program in due course. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Member Wilson. Kia ora, I'm going to be really short and sharp. This is getting to be a really, really um, big item. I actually didn't intend to, but I will, in the sense that I'll say trust and confidence and what we're doing here, I've never had such a, a, a very long conversation about what we do mostly in any of the committees around a, a structure, governance structure, and I'm unsure why we're getting into I absolutely agree with what was raised by Member um, Councillor Henderson, because now we're getting into the local. The, the, the Crown expects us to scoop up, and we're doing things um, with our communities as opposed to having it done to us. I'm sure it can be accommodated. Um, do what we do, do it pre-meeting, behind the scenes, until you get to a point where it can seamlessly be integrated into what's being proposed here. Thank you very much for the presentation. I hear, absolutely hear, if I hadn't heard before, which I had heard before, this is pretty important. Let's do this rather quickly. Let's get into the meaty bits as soon as we can, but I'm not sure how we can do if we have this rather... I agree with the workshops. I agree with Councillor Henderson. I agree with Mayor Goff. Let's just do it, surely. Kia ora. Thank you, Member Wilson. Uh, Councillor Fletcher. Oh, <laughs> I, I think Member Wilson and I have been conferring on this. Um, and it's one of the difficulties where we don't take supplementaries after people. But I want to ask Wayne, because of his experience, this is an excellent initiative. All we're doing is setting up a reference group today 
if the purpose of a reference group and the governance will be back here amongst us as elected members, isn't this already too big? <laughs> so, um, I just want to, uh, the chair's to be commended my, for bringing us. Meeting to, and it's not my decision. Keep it as small as possible and see how it works. And that really comes down to how interaction happens between you and the people who are on it while it's going on. You don't have, you don't have to closet things up until you come back to a committee. You, you, you're meeting all the time. You can have conversations over the coffee. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's nothing secret here. And I, and I think I've got, I've, I've got a sense of what the team's going to have to do here, and they're going to have to move very, very quickly, and they're going to have to get guidance very, very quickly. There's two sides of go two. This, governance starts with a G, so does guidance, and there's two roles here. I see the, I see the, the, the reference group as a guidance. The driving group who sort of say who's constantly saying, "Have you taken this into account? Are you taking that into account? We need to draw that issue up and take it upstairs because it's, it it involves a bigger a bigger way of thinking than you're dealing with here." And, and it, it, so it's a flow. It's not a. I think we think in square boxes sometimes, but it's a, it's about allowing the team to move at pace with some confidence and having a mechanism to take the wider governance along with it as it happens. And that's the sole role of the reference group is to make that connection and bring and bring the governance wisdom to the guidance process uh, as it's going along. It's it's I don't think of it as another committee. Can't won't work if you do. Um, Chair, I would ask you to reflect, I mean, A, everyone's agreeing with this. We all think this is a terrific idea. Well, this committee's been on, my 102-year-old aunt has died, and maybe it's making me feel a bit impatient, but we're going round and round in circles on this. I already think this is too big, unless you've got some proposals that will reduce, diminish the numbers that we've got on the reference group for all the reasons here. Um, I think we should just get on with it and look forward to the reports back. Thank you, Councillor Fletcher. Uh, we have four people left for questions and we will try and um, move along because I purposely said we do not need lunch today um, uh, because we'll be finished early and that was probably, that was probably my fault. Um, uh, Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you for... Uh, this presentation, I just, I wanted to pick up on the languaging of it is very non-committal, considering that it's a huge thing that needs to be done, that we all agree needs to be done, but it's, you know, it's, it's like modeling an indicative pathway as opposed to achieves 64%. You know, like um, the plan includes targets to have regional emissions, includes targets as opposed to this is how you're going to have it. You know what I mean? Like, very, very non-committal. Kind of like a recent relationship I'm in. Very non-committal. So, um, <laughs> you know, like, how are we, how, you know, are we going to move to it being committal? Like, how's that going to happen? And then also, is there space, because from what I see, things we get told, this is how you're going to, you know, this is, this is how you could achieve emissions reduction. Um, but how is there going to be space to ensure that the ideology will work in with the reality? Because that is where we lose people. Um, and for this to happen, we need people. We need people to change their behaviours. So they need to believe in this and they need to be part of it. Um, so that's where I'm going with this. In terms of the FOMO around the <laughs> committee makeup. I agree with reducing it, like, you know. But then I also agree with what Wayne said about the role of this committee or this working re reference group, because what's up there gives a lot to the reference group to do, and I can understand why people are concerned about that. Thank you. Is that more of a uh, maybe? I, I guess uh, from my perspective, Councillor Bartley, that is what we aim to do around the the making, you know, modelling versus target. The issue is we keep putting up targets without showing any of the ways we're going to get there. And this is the final, finally, a piece of work that will actually 
Because we all sit around here and go, what if we just add a cycleway? What if we just add a new bus? What if we just, you know, put congestion pricing in? But no, we haven't modelled, we haven't got that um, sitting anywhere, connecting it up to show us what that would do. And I don't, it may not bring the community with us at, at the beginning, but at the moment we're all speaking of these little projects, trying to bring the community with us, and we actually don't know if that will do anything for emissions. So I think the kind of difficult bit is what might, what will come back to all of us uh, through the workshops and through the committee, at least by December, will be some pretty high picture goals to start getting the community understanding what it actually means. Even the people who are telling us to go harder and faster, they might be surprised too what that actually looks like if we, if we want to achieve the goals that we've already committed to a year ago. We've already said we're going to do this. The problem is we've never really delved into how. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to help answer Councillor Bartley's question, but I think, I think just making sure too that this process is not going to in March, suddenly click and change everything, change the budget, change the RLTP. This will then influence all our future decisions. Are we looking at the pathway? How does this involve the pathway? How does this change the next policy? How do we get the money for that? And it's also going to show government what we need, because they keep telling us we have to reduce our emissions, and on our balance sheet that might not work with the, the budget we have. But we don't know right now. We keep talking in the, in the high level without actually understanding what it means. If you have a question, um, if I didn't cover what you asked, the staff might have something added. But uh, Councillor Henderson, question. Thanks for your indulgence, Chair. Just a quick question. Are we contemplating working behind the scenes with Auckland Unlimited to raise the game on economic development so that we're not just making trips more efficient, but we're reducing total trips across the network? Is that what so as Abby said right at the start, we're looking at a whole range of, of interventions and one of the ones that will have a big impact is how we actually reduce the number of trips. Um, so we'll be, we've used the term selected engagement, targeted engagement. We'll definitely be talking to our um, CCO cousins, we can call them that, brothers and sisters. Um, but just to stress the point, we see one of the key things in here is how we reduce the number of trips because that directly relates to reducing emissions. Um, thank you. Sorry, I... Um, oh, the, the other thing about Auckland Unlimited, uh, Councillor Henderson, I'm hoping that they are able to come along to the next committee because they are now working with the budget, part of the $152 million worth of climate initiatives for their climate innovation hub, which is already the planning is underway and they're going to be working with business and communities to do exactly what you're saying and hopefully that um, connects up as well. Uh, Councillor Collins. Uh, th thanks Chair. My, mine, I th yes, um, I'll make this into a question and I, it's, uh, I want to pull up from, I, I like the idea of committal, uh, commit a because, and I thanks Councillor Bartley, because I'm asking this question in relation to the communities that you'll engage with. So I guess I can wait a bit when you establish the stakeholder group and, and who you're going to be speaking with. But often in these situations, I love the idea of a vision, eh? being ambitious about where we're going, because I think that's really important. And I think Pacific people understand that really well. Uh, granted, it's our islands that will a we it's that are sinking at the moment. So with the idea or the, the backdrop to being committed or, or being committal in the way we approach this is how are we going to ensure that the voices of the poor are genuinely heard, not just consulted, because there's research papers galore on how we're tired of people coming out to South Auckland and asking us lots of questions and there's no loop back in. So granted the challenges of the poor and the vulnerable and the communities that have gas guzzlers to get the kids to sport on the weekend, how, how can I be confident, regardless if it's this group or a bigger group, smaller group, whatever group, that those voices are genuinely going to be heard, considered and taken in and taken on board? Um, uh, thank you for your question. Um, definitely as part of this work, we need to ensure that we speak to a 
wide variety of groups and people, and we're not just speaking to them to get information when they've already told us that this is what they want, they've committed to it. So we uh, we know through submissions on Te Tarukia Tafri, long-term plan, RLTP, that a lot of communities in the South, Manafenua, Iwi, they have put in strong submissions in favour for action. And as you mentioned, um, Pacific peoples have um, supported this because um, of the implications on the Pacific Islands. So that will definitely be part of the uh, engagement process that we're doing. We're not just going out fresh to start from scratch, uh, so to speak. Um, in terms of the, um, I guess, the benefits of decarbonisation, there are a lot of co-benefits that will address some of the inequities that we currently have in our transport system. We have um, very unsafe roads that particularly impact on um, communities in the south and the west, um, rural communities as well. We have higher levels of air pollution in parts of Auckland because of the proximity to motorways. Um, we have areas that have that are significantly car dependent because of the lack of alternatives. And so having a... Um, a uh, transport emissions reduction plan that has a strong focus on increasing accessibility will help to start unlocking uh, some of the barriers that these communities face in changing, um, because we know that if we don't set a just transition, communities will be forced to change. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Collins. Last question, Councillor Stewart. Thank you. <clears throat> My question is, um, if you think that, you know, that we're all really serious about this, we've all decided to buy into it, do you think that we should really be pushing for the government and the Greens um, Party in particular to look at, um, we've got all these Japanese import cars that are coming, if we really, really were serious, uh, any car that's over 10 years of age, the hats shouldn't be coming into the country because they are causing a lot of the emissions, and that, that would be a very easy way of, of cutting back. So if everybody's really, really serious about this, that's what they would be doing. We could keep going round and round in circles, but that really is, is the one thing that would really, really work. Now, I've just been speaking to Councillor Collins, and apparently in Samoa, they don't have cars that are over 10 years of age. Seven. Seven years of age. I lived in Singapore. 1991, 93, and back then, they didn't have cars that were over seven years of age. If they did, you had to pay a very um, high um, registration and insurances and that sort of thing. So if we're really, really serious, if New Zealand's really serious, if the government's really serious, and if the Greens are really serious, that's something they should be considering. Thank you. Um. Yes, that's a really good point. And the government has committed to uh, introducing a clean car standard. So New Zealand is currently one of three countries that don't have um, standards around the um, uh, efficiency of the fleet. So this will help us address some of the issues that we have with old polluting fleets that are in our country. And also not having it will mean that we there's a risk that we become a dumping ground when other cities and other countries start banning these cars um, so, so that is definitely part of the government's plan. And just a slight to add, we've talked a lot about transformational change. One of the changes that we'll need to, need to look at with this work is getting people out of their cars. So we don't actually need more cars, which as Wayne also said, they also used as a lot to take up our road space for storage. So addressing the fleet is one part, but the more fundamental thing is how can we change the way people travel away from a private vehicle? So it's looking at both of those. And if I could add a final point, one of the things which is, which is so hard and difficult about this whole climate change piece is there are just no silver bullets. That will be part of it, and there will be hundreds or possibly thousands of other solutions that we need to find. Like That's the scale of the transformation. So we need everything, and we need it quickly. Yeah. 100% agree with you, Councillor Stewart, and it is the, the clean car standard that's going to do that, which was... Was it the beginning of the year that they announced it to come in? Because we do have one of the oldest fleets in the world, um, and it, or the oldest, um, and it's not necessarily age, but it is going to be a very soon going to be measure, measuring emissions, so that it will end up being age-related. But um, that is going to change the emissions profile of our vehicles pretty quickly. So we're going to go quickly to a five-minute break, and then we'll come back. So uh, 12...
25, and then if we get um, staff members to move back now. So thank you very much.
and what's the last bit? Yeah. So we will head back to the, so we've had a few people offer up, Councillor Darby has offered to um, come off the reference group. If, um, if Councillor Bartley can't make it, he will come in. Uh, Councillor Dalton is going to do CCO Oversight Committee and Bill Cashmore will be the alternate. I will be there in place of the Chair of the Environment and Climate Change Committee and Pippa will come as an alternate if I cannot make it. And the same with the Independent Māori Statutory Board, it'll be the Chair or Deputy Chair. So that narrows down the numbers, but then we, then we also have added at the bottom um, including regular reporting to this committee. So there'll be an, uh, uh, there will be more um, extensive uh, coming back to the full committee. And I hope that it's trying to cover the situation that we've been dealing with through the, throughout the committee. Thank you. Um, now I'm going Mr. to- it's Mr. Chair, just yes. a seconder. Yes. Um, the word alternate is missing in one in Little three just needs to be there to say that it's the deputy chair or the alternate chair. No, the the, the chair wants to be the alternate for if that. If Angela cannot make it, then um, can, uh, deputy mayor will come. So the so I've we've um, finished questions. So we're going to go straight to. Yes, councillor. I, I'm, sh I'm sure that would be um, fine. Yeah. Cool. Um, and we'll get back to you on that. So, sorry about that. So we um, have five speakers so far. Councillor Watson um, speaking to. Yeah, th thank you, Mr Chair. And I, and I guess it's been an interesting uh, convergence this week of uh, Climate-related announcements or initiatives, hasn't it? I mean, if we uh, we start with the latest intergovernmental panel on climate change right at the start of the week, um, we're told scientists are observing changes in the Earth's climate in every region and across the whole climate system. Many of the changes observed in the climate are unprecedented in thousands of years. Some of the changes already set in motion such as sea level rise, are irreversible over hundreds of thousands of years. The report provides new estimates of the chances of crossing the global warming level of 1.5 degrees Celsius um, in the next decades and finds that unless there are immediate, rapid and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, uh, limiting warming to close to 1.5 or even 2 degrees Celsius will be beyond reach. Mm -hmm. And remember, at 2 degrees Celsius, uh, heat extremes would have often reached critical tolerance thresholds for agriculture and health, um, the report shows. And that came out on August 9th. Uh, coincidentally, during the week, I saw news items from Greece where children's play equipment was melting in the sun. So if you mm -hmm. think of those little parks that are dotted around Auckland. If you think of the slides and the seats melting, that was what was happening in Greece. One of the other convergence uh, items was the, re was the release of um, vehicle sale data for New Zealand. And that broadly um, showed that New Zealanders are now driving bigger cars, traveling greater distances, and emitting more carbon dioxide as they go. Um, the top four most popular new passenger cars last year were all SUVs. Even the poor old Toyota Corolla uh, lost its number one spot it held for, for many years. 55% of all vehicle sales were SUVs, and of course SUVs typically emit more than about 10 to 15% in, in terms of emissions and equivalent passengers. That was the second piece of news that, that I came across. And, and I guess the third piece of news is um, our item here today, the proposed approach and government structure for the Transport Emissions Reduction Plan. And um, I guess when I, when I put them all together, 
I just wonder um, how um, fast or, or meaningful is um, the response that, that is emerging, given that, you know, without uh, perhaps being too cynical on things, this kind of process seems to be a, a rerun of any number we've, we've, we've had already. And I, and I think the report is a good one, but I, I think point 70 signals certainly some of the concerns that, that I've got and that in terms of any interventions being implemented in a, in, a, in a meaningful way. So they talked about the constraints of slow decision-making processes. I think we could all recognise that. Mixed signals from central government, particularly in respect of the approach to urban growth, um, and I would combine with that maybe no signals in, in terms of um, often response at a community level, and the lack of community mandate for certain solutions, because that's pretty clear the communications with the community um, are, are scarce or... or or lacking in, at the least. And if we, if we take on board probably one of the more telling statements in the report that reducing the amount people try, drive is critical to reducing transport emissions, um, and that Auckland has a disproportionate part to play in the New Zealand picture, then we really have a job to do with actually getting, getting people on board. And uh, someone mentioned in the presentation how this change facing us was probably the biggest since the Second World War. I think it, it probably could go back a, a few millennia before that, to be honest. But if we take that Second World War as an appropriate analogy, I would suggest we perhaps need the, the same sort of command structure that existed in the war, because the, uh, the rather sort of lengthy bureaucratic um, response doesn't seem to have really produced too much meaningful thus far, even to a population or the parts of the population that are receptive to actually doing things now. And there's any number of things that could be happening right at the moment to reduce those uh, kilometres per individual or per vehicle travelled. They haven't started. Um, what, is the, what is the lead in to the change, to the dramatic change we talked about? Well, there is none. There is no real um, kind of plea going out to people who are sympathy, sympathetic to be doing any number of initiatives now that aren't high cost, that make use of the existing infrastructure, and that begin that step process to the greater change we've talked about before. I would suggest that that is a, a very big failing in both the, local, in the, the, the central government in particular, they are the ones who are leading out in this, but also us in terms of picking that up in, in our messaging, as, as we call it. So, Mr Chair, I heard the little bell go. I would suggest that that bell is ticking for all of us in a, in a far more potentially devastating way than, than the five minutes at Auckland City Council. Thank you, Councillor Watson. Hmm? Councillor Philippine. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, look, item 13 on our agenda is why we're here. And that's the report seeks delegated authority for the establishment of what you've now done um, in D. So that's all I'm going to uh, talk about because uh, we know how important this is. Um, I do, however, um, Your Worship, I took exception to some of the comments you made, and it's important for me to, to air those exceptions um, so, so, so then I can be very clear where, uh, around why. And, and, and that is, Your Worship, the questions that, at least I can only speak for myself, the questions I asked around um, our community is why we are here and around this delegated authority, Your Worship. And then when I heard you say that, you know, the questions uh, around the numbers, we need to stay away because these are important. This is why we've got this agenda item on here. And, and, and I thought that my questioning from your perspective <laughs> Was um, was was 
too much in the, the, the detail when we've got a very important job to do. So, so from my perspective, this is why I asked the questions, because I know, and the responses I got, was that community engagement is so, so important, whether it be with uh, our Pacific community, as Councillor Collins pointed out, whether it be with um, around our four well-beings, um, whether it be with, with all our communities across Tamaki Makaurau. So if, if, if I got it misinterpreted what you said, Your Worship, my apologies, but that's how I heard it. Um, because that's all my questioning was around, is, is because we're here to approve really the, the, the delegated authority to the establishment of the Transport Emissions Re Reference Group. That's, that's all my questions were there. In regards to this reference group, um, Chair, I just want to say that um, the changes you have made is, is exactly what I think uh, should have been done. And, and um, just to let everybody know, and I spoke to Councillor Casey, the Deputy Chair of our Parks, Arts, Community and Events Committee, we did not want to go in here on, on this particular reference group. What the point I wanted to make is that everything uh, around uh, our committee is around community. You know, and, and, and that applies to, to all the committees um, uh, uh, across Tamaki. So my point was saying that we just please do not forget our communities, do not forget our Pacific people, especially in light of, of the effects that, that their their families, their Ainga, are having in their respective islands. So, um, Chair, fully support this, fully support the changes that you have made, and I look forward to, to, to all the updates that will come through to, to this committee and with workshops. Kia ora. Kia ora, Councillor. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Dalton coming through on Skype. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. Look, my comments are simply related to the recommendations of the item and not the broader issues around the impacts of climate change. Um, in addition to the diversity issues that have been raised by the other speakers, I think what is really important for the strategic part of this particular process is that the reference group from the governing body side has a political balance. So there is some assurance around the table that there can be some disruptive thinking and alternative contributions from different worldviews. Um, that can be achieved through a committee scenario, but I, I can't even imagine where we would find the hours to do that given the time allocated so far today, deciding on the participants to a reference group. So I'll be supporting your uh, new recommendations here today. I'd also like consideration to be given to resourcing this work. It is a priority in the long-term plan, and I'd like to see a submission to the annual plan for additional resourcing I'd be happy to sponsor that advocacy. So just to sum up, I'd like to thank everyone that presented this item today, some really interesting conversations. Um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to be on the reference group because we are over the tipping point in addressing these issues around climate change. And I look forward to ensuring that all of my colleagues are kept up to date and informed as we progress through. So thank you, Chair, for this opportunity. Kia ora, Councillor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Henderson. Thanks, Chair. Um, two quick points. I mean, firstly, perhaps I wasn't clear in bringing up the um, makeup of the uh, committee, even though that's what we're, we're debating. Um, I agree with the Mayor. The issues here are so huge. Like I've said in my question, this is maybe one of the biggest things that we will ever discuss as a Council. And so my point really was that this is the committee, in my view. All of us need, need to input that. Um, I, look, I'm going to vote for it today um, because I think it is, has improved being a little bit smaller and with a little bit more flexible, but I want regular reporting and regular work um, through this. It's more important than most of the stuff we talk about, frankly. Um, I'm not saying break it down ward by ward, um, but also as part of that, I'd like to see representation from the Youth Advisory Panel and the Pacific Panel as well as part of those wider workshops that we have together. 
because they have they have huge um, they're fantastic by the way and they've got huge um, things to contribute. Uh, but the second point I wanted to raise was around my questioning around communications. Um, I won't go there on, on innovating streets, but I think I could probably write a book on that um, now. I think it'd be a good book. Maybe I should do it one day. Um, but yeah, we have the majority of people demanding action, but there are communities out there that just haven't considered things like this. And we, we forget those communities, frankly, working class communities that are just out there trying to put food on the table, right? The, the fact is, poorer communities in Auckland cannot afford to care about climate change. That's the reality. And yet we are faced with drastic decisions that we have to do to, that will disrupt people's lives. And we need to make a serious attempt at actually bringing those people along with us. You know, we've heard voices from communities saying, why don't you do something about climate change in the abstract? We don't hear enough from individual communities saying, my neighbourhood could use this, my neighbourhood could use that, because we want to do our bit for climate change. We don't hear that. You know, I had protests on, on the streets of my ward around this on a project that would have actually really helped climate change emissions and climate change mitigation. We can't sit here and say that the community are with us on this point. Not a lot of communities out there anyway. Um, and, you know, it's our democratic duty that at the end of the day, we can only go as far as the public actually let us go. <laughs> so we've got a big challenge between what we actually need to do and what the public will let us do. And as the mayor has said, and I really love this quote, and I say it all the time, that we govern by consent every day, not just at the ballot box. And so I, th I would remind the committee of this point, and I think that's, that's sort of what we should be doing, working really hard at their communications, bringing poorer communities along, and, and empowering and enabling them. Um, yeah, that's all I've got to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Councillor Walker. Um, I've had a chance to read the uh, report. The concern that um, that I have on, on an ongoing basis is the necessity for scenarios, because that is the only way to break through the impasse that we have in respect of advice from officers and in respect of our own um, decisions. We're increasingly locked into, for example, a long-term plan. We don't consider any alternative Pathways is the word that's uh, used here, but there's nothing, in fact, pathway is singular in this. So I have a real concern that, again, we're just looking at uh, one track. Um, there will probably probably be budgetary um, considerations and the like. Um, you know, often when we have meetings, increasingly, people thump their hands on the, um, on the table and they talk about limiting what we're doing because of budgets and the like. That is not the approach that we can take. It is not the approach that we can take. So we need a scenario-based approach. We need to embrace the changes that that means around uh, finance. We need to have far better integration from people from outside who I would suggest have significantly more to uh, contribute than what we may even have within our um, organisation. We also need to build relationships with other cities that are way ahead of us. So we should be re-looking at our membership of ICLEI, for example, and the opportunity for councillors to engage in webinars and let's have an eco-mobility uh, trial. I've been to a couple of those. Let's engage with our communities and local boards, not have the largely introverted approach that we're increasingly having that's driven by um, finance. Let's look at our decisions on an ongoing basis. We made a decision the other day not to have a marina strategy when the marinas are going to be the lifelines for transport within Auckland with the emergence of the need to adapt around climate change and mitigate. Yet we made a bad decision then. That was only just a few days ago. So on a decision by decision basis, the body of people around this room continue not to make the right decisions when we're actually capable of that and when we're actually getting advice from the community that's at odds with that, that raises issues around climate change if we want to listen to it. It's really important around this issue that we take on the government. We haven't been very good at that. So quite clearly, right now, we need electricity reforms, and those reforms need to go to Auckland. 
Otherwise, everything that we're talking about that goes to electrifying the fleet is frankly redundant. Are we taking that on? Does this council have any energy strategy? No, we don't. Have we even considered it? No, we haven't. Should we? Well, arguably, yes, because energy constitutes a very significant part of our emissions. But again, we're silent on things like that, largely, I'd suggest, because we've got a reluctance to provide the leadership uh, in Auckland that we need to and to challenge the government. And right now, as it stands, our biggest challenge is the takeover by government in terms of planning, in terms of transport, in terms of water and sewage and stormwater, in fact, almost everything. So if we are going to stand up around climate change and what we can do in Auckland, then we need to be much more vocal for Auckland than what we are right now, because we are essentially silent. So I'm just putting some hard things on the table. It's been 10 years now since I led out the first climate change strategy for Auckland, where we actually had some roadmaps identified, and those roadmaps were never developed, they were actually discarded. So we've lost 10 years now, which is incredibly disturbing. So I'm certainly interested in engaging this process as one councillor, and I would help hope that others are, because I've certainly taken um, an interest in this on, on an ongoing basis, Mr Chair, and I am incredibly disturbed at the situation that we're in 10 years after the beginning of this um, council under the leadership of the then Mayor, Len Brown, where we were making, I think, significantly more progress than what we're making now. Thank you. Kia ora. Thank you. Councillor Walker, Mayor Goff. Um, thanks very much, uh, Mr Chairman. Look, um, we're making this decision, interestingly, in the very week that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out, and anyone that... Uh, that read and uh, went through that report that wasn't incredibly distressed by what it means for humankind uh, needs, to, needs to think again. Uh, we are faced with a disaster. We're seeing those disasters right now. Uh, the wildfires, the droughts, the flooding, the sea level rises. Um, you know, Trump was a dinosaur. The days of leaders that say that there is no such thing as uh, climate change, I hope, are well and truly past. But the fact is that time is not just running out. The time for climate change action is not tomorrow. Uh, it has to be today. And this is a further wake-up call. And I think the public um, understands that, though the public may not understand the costs that will be imposed by dealing effectively with it. So um, when we looked at what we can do in Auckland, um, the thing that stood out was transport, because it's 39% uh, close to 40% of our global emissions, our, our carbon emissions. And to reduce that by 64% is huge. That means that we have to transform the whole way in which transport works in our city. Uh, it can't be more motorways, more sprawling city, uh, uh, and, and ongoing use of uh, uh, internal combustion engines. Those changes have got to be made. It's no good us just saying we're going to reduce it by 64%. We have to have a plan about how we're going to reduce it. And that's what the work of the officers are going to be on this committee. Um, and we need to know what the cost of that is. And I just, again, draw your attention, Mr Chair, to the fact that we haven't talked about cost, but I am simply assuming that cost will be part of the report back to us. Because if we don't have the costs, we're, we're kind of dealing with the theoretical. Once we've got the costs, we know... OK, that's, that's what we have to do. Now, how can we do it? Um, in terms of the committee, um, Councillor Philippina, I wasn't getting at your comments. I was basically saying, you know, there are three or four different committee chairs and vice chairs we could have put on that, but we would end up with a committee the same size as, as this grouping. And what we needed... This, this, this working group is not going to be the group that makes the decisions. This is so important that officers are going to have to come back to us again and again in workshops to have the discussions. All of us. None of us want to be left out of this, so I take your point. Um, but uh, what, we, what we will always also be doing is that we'll be making the hard decisions in this committee and in finance and, and performance. 
when we make those hard decisions, we need to have clear explanations about what we're doing, how we've prioritised it, and how we're going to pay for it. And we need to have a breakdown between what we pay for and what government pays for. Now, I'm conscious of the fact that government takes the vast majority of public revenue in this country, and they'll be leading it. And their uh, emissions reduction plan in, in December is going to have a really big influence on, on what we're doing. But can we say, well, no, it's all government, and we don't have a role to play? Of course we can't. We do have a role to play. We will play that role, and we will work in partnership, not only with government, but also with interest groups, with businesses, uh, with community groups, and members of the public. We're all in this together. Um, you know, the sea level rise is going to affect every walker. Uh, no, there is no escaping this, and there is no escaping the cost. You know, I wince when I think of the cost of it, so does the chair of the Finance Committee, but we will meet that cost anyway. The question is, do we meet the cost after the disasters have befallen us, or do we meet that cost before and try to preempt the disasters? But make no mistake, Somewhere along the line, we as taxpayers and ratepayers are going to have to pay for the actions to stop the, the, the rise in carbon emissions from our country, which is one of the highest in the world per capita in the, in, in the industrial world. So we have to take it on. We have to be part of it. This is a plan that takes us in the right direction. But the decisions that will be made won't simply may be made by the uh, Transport Emissions Reference Group. They are simply adding regular guidance to the officers, but we will have those discussions back here in workshops and we'll have to make decisions that will probably be the most important decisions we will make in our time on this council. Thank you, Mayor Goff. Uh, Councillor Young. Oh, no, sorry, Councillor Darby. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, look, thanks to the staff, um, the board directors, uh, Deputy Chair Wayne MacDonald and, and Director Abby, uh, Abby Reynolds and Greg Nelson, Jacques Victor, you chair for bringing this up. Uh, this is the product that came out of the regional land transport decisions. Um, we recognised then that we were coming up way short and we needed to do something uh, dramatic and do it soon. So it's good to see this step taken. We've spent a long time discussing a pretty simple structure, really. Um, and uh, the real contest is going to be when we get into the thick of it, when this uh, Transport Emissions Reduction Plan Reference Group comes back to us. Me, uh, Chair, I, I signalled that I'd come off this trying to break down the footy team plus very hefty reserve bench down to a, something that may, maybe would resemble a netball team. Um, we're, we're getting there, um, but I'm sure I'll be part of it and those that have... Uh, step aside, we'll continue to be part of it. But, um, you know, we, we need to be a, a bit more nimble in the way that we do these things. I can't help also, and I do thank Chris Thurston from Watercare, and I, I, I love on one of his slides the line, act on climate like a proud ancestor. Act on climate like a proud ancestor. And I'm sure Mana Whenua can identify with a line like that. Um, and I do too, and the key word is act. Um, it's a very, very powerful message, and it's a really powerful message for all of us in governance. And while it's going to take all of society to respond, uh, we're the ones in the dock on this, and uh, we won't be leaving the dock on this uh, for a very long time. Uh, in fact, I think our communities uh, are starting to see us as um, being guilty until proving our innocence on climate change. Uh, right now, I think we're in the guilty category. Um, and uh, in some ways, we're deserving to be in the dock. So that goes for all elected members, whether you're mayor, councillor, local board member, whether you're a, a, an MP, a cabinet minister, or a prime minister, uh, we are all in that category at the moment. There is um, high expectation placed on us to make sure that we move past I think we have moved past climate denial into, and past climate delay and the pretense of, of action and so-called incremental action and looking good action to real, you know, demonstrating very real and meaningful action. That's where we need to start being every day. And as others have outlined, the scale of the response is going to have to be immense. It's going to have to be very dramatic. It is not going to look remotely like 
living as we know it in present day. But that doesn't mean to say it's not going to come with, as Abby Reynolds said, some beauty and some opportunity. There's going to be some nuggets in this as well. Um, but there's no denying that we cannot be uh, head in the sand and thinking the Athenian fires just belong in Europe or the burning of Siberia as it is at the moment just belongs somewhere else or the floods in Germany, they, they're just another European thing. Um, this is at our gate as well and it's, it's sadly it's just a matter of time before we have such a catastrophe here on, on that unimaginable scale. The, the point I would like to make today, uh, Chair, is, is yes, the burden could be immense, but the opportunity could be phenomenal. Um, the costs might be high, but the costs will, of inaction will be incomparable with the cost um, of actually paying our way to get there at the, at the moment. And I, I guess one thing that really worries me is just where the leaders are in their action. So when we start to, in, in the months ahead of next year, ask Aucklanders to consider dramatic changes in how they move about the city, they are going to be pointing to us and they're going to say, what was your change, leader? What was your change? And we can't be at risk of being called out as the laggard leaders at that point. So we are going to have to change our behaviours ahead of asking Aucklanders to change their behaviours. <coughs> Otherwise, this is all hollow man uh, direction setting. And so I'm going to be changing even more so my personal travel behaviours um, because this is an immense issue that is not going to go away for a long time and uh, we are going to have to show our, our change and our behaviour all around this table, around local boards, around cabinet tables, uh, all of the political leaders uh, are going to have to show at the outset that we are doing things differently. Thank you Councillor. Councillor Collins. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to touch on point 70 of the report as well. Uh, and uh, in coming to that, I, I really enjoyed what you had to say, Councillor Henderson. You, Thank you. I really enjoyed that. It was just around the lack of community mandate for, um, for certain solutions. I like the approach, avoid, shift, improve. This is awesome. I really liked, I read, um, I, I liked reading the report. It gave me a sense of ambition, a desire for change to be made. And I think that's a really good place for us to be. The committee was uh, it was pretty large last time, and now we're down to nine, I can see. I hope that it stay is it nine? Hey, that's really good. But I hope it does better than the NRL nines that we lost and went back to Australia. So let's make sure we maintain that impetus. I'm going to keep trying with my sporting analogies. I think the key for me is shifting it from the public policy, public discourse discussion to public reality. And the reality is for my community is that these shifts are really hard. It's hard to go from avoid to shift to improve when you're really dependent, when you don't have a lot of money. The report that came out from the, um, the Ministry of Transport around equity, was equity in Auckland, Auckland's transport, showed this. The number one finding was that low income is the most consistent factor affecting people's ability to afford transport to meet their needs. And their key recommendation out of that report was this, that equity should be far more explicit in transport policy. And that's my encouragement to this group of people to ensure that equity is at the core of our considerations. And that's what I mean by taking it from that public policy discussion to the public reality, because it is really tough on many in our communities to make that shift. I also wanted to talk a little bit about the comms. I think we've got to get the comms right, both in who we engage with and who's championing these messages. And look, we... Um, Councillor Henderson touched on innovating streets. I, there was an attempt just a couple of months ago to innovate the bridge. 
Yeah. Hey, and if we think about it, you know, I don't want to get into the pros and cons of that attempt, but that's part of the community saying, well, we didn't have a mandate, so we went out. My particular interest was how it was handled by the police, but the fact is there are, there are drivers in the community that want to see this change, but we've got to get the balance right, and that's what I mean about the comms, is that I think sometimes in Auckland we operate on such extreme spectrums where you've got people who just say, no, nah, not prepared to, to go with that, and those who are saying, let's change everything, and we've got to get the balance right. So I'm asking this committee to think carefully about the comms, carefully about, yeah, the, the, the changes that we're making. I caught the train uh, to, to the office today and, and had a great discussion with former Mayor Len Brown, who was also on the train and sat next to me. But th those are some of the steps that we can take, but who's going to lead this stuff out there? Because otherwise we're always going to be operating in our sections of the world, and regardless of the reports that we're reading that are saying to us we need to act in, um, with urgency, that public discourse means nothing if the public reality seems so far away from that. So we've got to make the connections better. Otherwise, it's just another report that says, yep, act with urgency, but I'm not sure what I'm supposed to do and how I'm going to get help along the way to make the changes that are necessary so that we have a planet to live on. Thanks. Kia ora. Uh, Deputy Chair Pippacum. Kia ora, Mr Chair. Thank you for the opportunity. I would like to um, speak in support, and in doing so, it is it's very difficult not to um, think of the context of the IPCC report and how depressing that report is in terms of the grim predictions and the real dire picture that it paints. Um, it's very frightening and sobering. Just, um, and just the fact that we have such a small window if we're going to stay within um, 1.5 degrees Celsius, and that window is, is rapidly shrinking. So this piece of work, um, in terms of the pathway, is going to have to do all of the heavy lifting, and I think that's why it's so significant and why I think we've had some really good contributions today, and I do thank the whole team um, for bringing this to us, because this bit of work is going to influence everything that we are doing around transport. Um, so it is in terms of setting this this up and, and having a, a reference group that will be bringing back the pathways in the TERP, and that's especially for you, Councillor Casey. You love a good acronym. Um, TERP, not TERP. The TURP, the TURP, the, the, so the TURP um, will be doing all of that heavy lifting if we're going to achieve our 64% um, reduction. And I'm going to channel, it was great having um, the board directors, Wayne and Abby along, and I'm going to channel all that positivity from Abby because it is, when you look at that, the picture from the IPC report being so depressing, but actually it is what Abby said, looking at that beautiful picture. Um, sorry, beautiful future, um, and really how compelling it is that if we act, if we get this pathway right, um, and the report does mention this on in paragraph six, particularly how the, the benefits of decarbonising the transport system, particularly around addressing inequalities, and we, we are very good at forgetting that the current transport system is deeply inequitable. Um, so this piece of work and the pathways that we're going to be developing have this great opportunity for cleaner air, fewer deaths and serious injuries, um, improved public health, lower infrastructure costs, and more equitable access to jobs, schools, health, services, recreation, and other opportunities. And I have just read that from the report because it's such a good summary about the, the, the benefits that we can be looking towards. In terms of the reference group, I did just want to say, it's a shame Councillor Alf has just left the room because I wanted to just say to him that um, when I think about the makeup, it isn't, skills was the wrong word. I mean, we just all have to have our regional councillor hat on and coming to this reference group and that 
none of us around this table have got skills specifically around climate change or sustainability, but what we can bring to it is some enthusiasm to, to work on this. And so everybody who wants to be involved, I think, should be invited into it. And of course, Councillor Walker, I know you've had a long um, background in, in, and, some is, and some skills. So I just think it's, it's all hands to the pump, and whoever wants to be involved in this work should come along and get involved. So I don't think we have to get ourselves to um, worked up about the makeup or or how many people are in the in the room because it's just going to boil down to who are the keen beans who really want to get stuck in and as has been said it will be coming back to the decision making of this committee I um, just wanted to highlight one thing in terms of um, one of the comments one of the contributors to the IPCC report said that one of the main takeaways was that the Earth's climate systems was responding faster than the politicians. And I think we, we end up hearing that a lot around at this table, that we all recognise the emergency, but then we get really bogged down in, in the weeds. And one of those big challenges that I acknowledge my colleagues have, have said is around that consultation and how we're bringing the community along. But I do think about this in terms of the COVID challenge. And in February last year, we didn't have time to start consulting with the community and bringing everybody along when we went into lockdown. We had to act. And I think we've all got to prepare ourselves for the fact that a lot of these pathways are going to be things that we're just going to have to act on really, really fast. There's not going to be an opportunity for rounds and rounds of consultation. But we can take a lot from the fact that Te Taurukia Tawhiri had one of the highest levels of engagement ever, particularly from um, uh, rangatahi young people's voices, from a real broad range of the community have came and gave us really strong support for, the, for having a plan for Auckland. So we, we know we have that mandate. We know we have to act. I know it can be hard when there's a lot of community um, hating on paint on the, the ground but in Henderson, but that is just going to be small fry when it comes to the really big issues and the really big actions that we're going to have to implement and will be coming out of this pathway. So thank you for the opportunity to be part of um, this work and for all of those who've brought it to us. And um, thank you, Mr Chair. I am very much, very supportive. Namihi. Sure, the Deputy Chair. Um, thank you, first of all, to um, Shining and Robert and Jacques and Jenny and Greg and Auckland Transport Board members, everyone who's been involved in this process. And I feel um, good about the, the relationship working together. It's much like the built relationship on the drought with water care. I think, unfortunately, sometimes the, the, the big, scary things um, fortunately bring us together, and I, I, I've enjoyed seeing um, that, and I'm sure it will happen um, ongoing. Um, thank you, everyone in, around the committee, for supporting and all the questions, comments, and interest in this subject. I think it is difficult. I said to Alex Crosby, who's left council now but was a, a councillor support advisor when I first became the chair of this committee, that I was never going to talk about climate disasters and storms and natural disasters because it scares everyone off and it doesn't actually um, achieve anything. <laughs> that was late 2019. Then we had, soon after that, fires in Australia, which turned our skies red. We then had... Um, uh, the drought begin, uh, Auckland's worst ever drought, which we're still currently in. Then we had a pandemic, which uh, many scientists are saying was driven by climate because we're inviting, uh, cutting down forests and uh, places where animals live, and those animals are now coming into communities and villages and spreading what usually is diseases that only spread to other animals. Uh, so we've got that situation coming on. Then we had a one in 500 year flood up in Whangarei that's caused significant damage and that council has had to deal with um, upgrading and changing things pretty quickly. We've had, um, this year we've had a one in 1,000 year flood in China. We've had floods in Berlin and parts of Germany that have never, ever, ever flooded. We've got settlements that were there well before the World Wars that weren't lost in World Wars that are now completely 
um, ruined. Uh, we've got fires in Greece right now. 200,000 hectares of, um, of forest has been burnt. There are, I was watching a news story with a farmer talking about how he believes his crops and where the whole town gets its food from will not recover for maybe 30 to 40 years, if that. Um, there are situations happening in New Zealand, Westport, we've had um, you know, significant flooding, all happen in one week on different coasts of our, of our um, country. A and I guess when we talk about cost, the cost of those things are far greater than anything we might need to spend now on climate um, and preventing these things from happening. We spent 10 million out of nowhere for the Newland floods. We then, with the drought, had to spend 224 million almost overnight during a pandemic to, to address our drought issues. I remember during the Tasman Tempest, Watercare had to spend a ton of money because we suddenly had clay in our water supply because the forests, um, the, the pine forests there were washed out. We had 150 slips on public land that time that we've had to, we're still fixing now four or five years later. Um, the, the cost of not doing anything is far greater than the cost of of acting. And what I see this as, what I see this pathway plan that all of us will be involved in, is actually trying to figure out how we do what we've said we're going to do and what we know we have to do. <laughs> With the IPCC report, you know, they've stopped saying 94% of scientists, they're just saying it's unequivocal. This is humans that are creating this problem and humans that are dealing with this problem. And unfortunately, it's our most vulnerable communities dealing with the heat, dealing with the difficulties of the coldest nights and the hottest nights without um, the housing and heating or air conditioning to support them. It's our more vulnerable communities who aren't having the access to the transport that we should be providing them. I have a bus that comes past my driveway every morning, every 10 minutes, and I get that bus because it's easy and it's frequent and there's a transit lane. There are communities, as Shane, Ofeso, Alf, many others around this table will do not have that opportunity. All we're saying is that we need to dramatically increase opportunities for our communities to have access to what I have access to and what other people have access to. It's not about forcing people out of their cars, because I believe in the next couple of years, and we've seen it since COVID, that the, we've started to recover, petrol prices have gone up 30 cents a litre in that short amount of time. Can you imagine what it's going to be like in six years, eight years, 10 years? UK and Europe and other um, there's some countries in Asia who are banning fossil fuel vehicles by 2030. So people are not going to make those cars, especially for us. So if we don't plan for electric vehicles, if we don't plan for walking, cycling, public transport, we're actually not going to have anything for our people to drive um, because actually there'll be no manufacturing of those products, especially of big markets like the UK and the Euro, um, European Union are not accepting those vehicles. So. I guess what I'm saying is that we keep saying we need to bring the community along with us, and I'm, I know we will. But we also had the highest numbers of Māori, Pacifica, and young people um, submit to Te Tārakia Tafi than we've had on any other plan that we've ever had saying that we need to act. We've had the highest support for an item on a 10-year budget that I can think of was the water quality targeted rates, the natural environment targeted rates, and now the $152 million extra for climate initiatives. Those were all way up there compared to anything I've seen in a 10-year budget. So people want us to act, and I guess it's now time to act. We're not going to do this alone, but we actually kind of have to get ahead of it and show people what it looks like. Because at the moment, we keep blaming everyone. I know we got angry at Auckland Transport. We, we had all these ideas, but actually we haven't shown people what it looks like. It probably will be unpalatable. It might be impossible. But if we don't start by showing people those pathways and showing people what needs to change, then actually we'll get nowhere and we won't reduce anything, and we won't improve our water quality, air quality, heat, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess this is a small part of what, the bigger part of what we need to do. Thank you all for being a part of it, and we will we'll try and save the world, um, but we at least need to do this for Tamaki Makoto and future generations. So thank you. All those in favor? <laughs> uh, anybody opposed? No, can I say that was passed unanimously? Thank you very much. Now, the, the sad thing is because I didn't plan on going this long, you, there is no um, lunch waiting for anyone, so we will go on to um, item 10 and try and get through this um, quite quickly, another important piece of the puzzle.
we are we doing the presentation as well? And we'll just, um, Matthew, if everyone can introduce, if everyone can introduce themselves um, briefly, and we'll just uh, try and click through the, the presentation quite quickly, and then we can have some questions. Thank you. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Matthew Blakey. I'm the Acting Chief Sustainability Officer here at Auckland Council. Kia Koto, I'm Helen Mahoney and I'm a Sustainability and Resilience Advisor in the Chief Sustainability Office. Uh, good afternoon, uh, John Bishop, the Group Treasurer. Good afternoon, Andrew John, uh, Funding Managing Treasurer. So we're here today to speak to you um, as members of the Chief Sustainability Office and the Treasury team on um, the C40 Divest Invest Declaration. So the purpose of the agenda item is us to provide you with an overview of the C40 Divest Invest Declaration and recommend that Auckland Council signs this declaration. The C40 Divest Invest Declaration is, is focused on cities divesting from their investments in fossil fuel assets, fossil fuel producing companies, um, and also investing further in sustainable finance and climate solutions, so financial investments towards climate solutions. The C40 Divest Invest Declaration, the declaration is um, tied up with our membership of C40. So as you are aware, C40 is a network of global cities that are taking bold action on climate change. Um, as part of our membership of C40 cities, we are required to meet certain leadership standards. There is no fee to join C40, but we need to meet these leadership standards in order to continue our membership. So as part of these leadership standards, we are required to endorse an additional declaration, one additional declaration by 2022. Endorsing the, the Divest Invest Declaration would meet this requirement, and it would add to two declarations that we have already endorsed, those being the Advancing Towards Zero Waste Declaration and the Green and Healthy Streets Declaration, formerly called the Fossil Fuel Free Streets Declaration. Those two declarations, the Advancing Towards Zero Waste Declaration and the Green and Healthy Streets Declaration, um, are reported on annually. And as part of our, um, our commitment to those declarations, we have completed a, a high-level action plan, or, or perhaps more appropriately, a summary table, um, as you can see here on the screen. So on the right-hand side there, you can see the Green and Healthy Streets Declaration. As part of that declaration, we pledged, we made a commitment to procure only zero emission buses from 2025. Um, as you know, that commitment was brought forward in the 10-year the budget, and we set the, 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 the accelerated deadline of the 1st of July 2021. So this is very much a standard format in terms of how we apply to a declaration and how we report on it. So the C40 Divest, in Decla Divest Declaration sets out three commitments. The first commitment is for a city to take all possible steps to divest city assets from fossil fuel companies and also to increase financial investments in climate solutions to help promote decent jobs and a just and green economy. So this is very much focused on ensuring that the money we spend, the money we spend goes towards financing positive climate outcomes. The second commitment is very much focused on, on pension funds and calling on pension funds to divest from fossil fuel companies and increase financial investments in climate solutions. Not applicable to Auckland based on the, um, the pension fund relationship that we don't have. Um, so the third commitment is very much focused on advocacy. And this is focused on advocacy, advocating for fossil fuel free and sustainable finance um, by other investors and all levels of government including by promoting the importance of strong long-term climate policies and demanding greater transparency. So this is very much focused on us delivering an impact beyond just Auckland. So very much taking an advocacy response to take others with us, looking at central government, looking at the private sector and seeing what we can achieve in terms of um, an impact beyond Auckland. There are um, five uh, requirements. Um, that the declaration outlines. We are required, if signing up, to take one or more of the following actions. So the first action is focused on making a commitment to increase investments in climate solutions and the green economy and to divest municipal investments from fossil fuel companies, which we've already done, and we'll come on to that. 
The, the following two requirements relate to pension funds, and as I've mentioned, they are, they are not relevant to the Auckland context. Um, the, the fourth requirement there is to monitor progress and commute this progress, communicate this progress to C40 on an annual basis by requesting regular progress updates on how the relevant portfolios are managing climate-related financial risks and opportunities. We'll be touching on that later in the presentation. And the fifth and final requirement is to use our influence to advocate for investments in climate solutions and divestment from fossil fuel companies by other actors, such as private financial institutions and our regional and national governments. And this is very much about Auckland taking the opportunity, taking this platform to promote what we're already doing, the great work we're already doing, and delivering further impact. I'll now pass on to Alan Mahoney. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so Auckland Council has already made multiple commitments to um, use sustainable finance mechanisms to drive our climate goals, but also to support the broader shift of our financial system to one that's more sustainable. Um, this is detailed in Te Tarukia Tafari within our economy priority, where we have committed to redirect capital towards sustainability outcomes, but also improve how we value social and environmental impacts um, alongside our financial impacts as well, and then um, build that broader awareness within our financial system. And as founding members of um, the Aotearoa Circle, we have also made a similar commitment um, to support the um, shift in our financial system. I'm gonna pass you on to John, who's gonna talk to um, some of the activities we're doing in more detail. Um, thanks, Helen. So, look, um, some of the financial things we do uh, in this area, um, any, any council investments are uh, covered by our, our responsible investment policy. Now, that was um, modified when we had our diversified financial asset portfolio a few years ago, uh, and the key plank of that was to exclude any divestments uh, in the production of, of fossil fuels. Uh, we also have a sustainable finance framework, um, which uh, is here to support our issue of uh, green bonds. And if I talk about our green bond program, uh, just reminding you, what is a green bond? Uh, it's uh, just like a normal bond that we raise, except its proceeds are used to uh, finance uh, projects which have a positive environmental or climate benefit. So it's a use of proceeds bonds. Why do we issue them? Um, there's a few advantages. One is they tend to be slightly cheaper than normal bonds. They also increasingly attract a larger pool of investors. Um, really, green bonds are becoming mainstream. Uh, so more of the world's investors and fund managers uh, are now focused very clearly on bonds which have a green or sustainable outcome. Um, importantly, too, it shows a lot of transparency around what we're raising money for. And also, it aligns with our funding and our strong sustainability objectives. Uh, Council has been a leader in the green bond market in New Zealand. We um, were the first New Zealand issuer to issue a green bond, and we've been one of the most active issuers in the market since. We've raised uh, 850 million through green bonds since 2018, and our, our most recent bond was a 30-year $500 million green bond, which has won uh, multiple awards. Uh, what do we use? Um, green bonds to fund a range of uh, projects which have positive uh, climate and sustainability benefits, including the CRL, electric trains, cycleways, and a number of water projects. Uh, to keep our investors informed, each year we publish a green bond annual report, and that details what we're spending the proceeds of these bonds on and how they contribute towards uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and achieving broader sustainability objectives. Thank you. Um, so one of the actions that we may choose to deliver on as part of this declaration is to align our reporting with the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosures framework. Um, so Auckland Council has actually been voluntarily disclosing under this framework for the last two years and we'll be releasing our third um, climate related disclosure in the next annual report. 
Essentially, the TCFD framework requires organisations um, to disclose on how climate-related financial risks and opportunities are embedded within their organisation. Um, the framework itself is structured around four key areas of a business. They are risk management, governance, strategy and metrics and targets. And then there are 11 recommended disclosures within that framework that we are required to disclose on. Now, part of the TCFD framework is for organisations to carry out a climate change risk assessment using different climate scenarios. This is also referred to as scenario analysis. Um, and this will be carried out in the next stage of our TCFD response. Um, undergoing this assessment is going to give us a much better understanding of how we might perform under different climate scenarios so that we can make more informed strategic decisions. But it's also going to allow us to understand how we are financially exposed to climate change, which will inform how and where we allocate capital and um, moving it away from um, activity that might expose us further to climate related financial risks. So as well as the activity that we've just detailed, there's also a lot of work that is um, currently under underway and is in the pipeline. Um, so as we spoke about today, we have an investment of $152 million in climate act action, um, and that will be carried out over the next 10 years. We've also acknowledged that most of our work, uh, sorry, most of our funding is um, ne will need to be through mechanisms such as green bonds in the future. So in response to this, we are expanding our eligible asset list. Um, and that means identifying more assets and projects that meet the green bond criteria. We're also working with the rest of the group as well to identify other sustainable finance tools such as sustainability linked loans and bonds um, that we might use to drive further sustainable and climate and social outcomes as well. And then as just detailed, we'll be carrying out a climate change risk assessment to understand what are the climate related financial risks that are most material to the group. Okay, so um, as discussed, we are demonstrating much alignment to the declaration. Um, when it comes to government, we're really leaders in the sustainable finance space, um, but there is still work that we will need to do as part of this declaration. Um, so in order to deliver on the requirements of this declaration, we'll need to increase our financial investments in climate solutions. And that also includes increasing um, investments in solutions that help to deliver a just and green economy. We also need to play more of an adv advocacy role as well. Um, and that includes being an advocate to central government, investors and other financial institutions to also invest in climate solutions um, and increase their use of sustainable finance. And then we'll need to monitor this progress um, and communicate that to C40 on an annual basis. So that concludes our presentation. Um, we welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Councillor Walker, you've questioned Councillor Kuma. So I've, I've just got a, um, a question and I've just, you know, generated a quick um, um, brainstorm of some issues that could be risks. So, for example, um, Auckland Council is one of the largest farmers, if not the largest farmer in the Auckland region, and we have significant methane emissions from ruminants. I would expect that would be identified as a risk particularly given that the IPCC has identified that reducing methane emissions is one of the fastest ways, if not the fastest way, that we can actually reduce our emissions footprint. So that's a question. Um, in terms of um, um, the group, are we including our investments in ports of Auckland and Auckland Airport um, as it goes to risks, obviously, Auckland Airport is involved with long-haul flights and the like. Um, they have an interest in that. Ports of Auckland has risks in terms of vessels that um, dock in, in Auckland, many of which are high emitters in terms of their carbon footprint and the management of that in port. Um, are we analysing any risks associated with transport projects that we or the government is investing in in the region that actually intensify our carbon footprint and lock us in. Um, and there may be a number of examples of those. In terms of influence, obviously, we bank with various institutions. Are we examining 
the bank or banks that we effectively invest in or place money in, um, and how those banks are, are acting in respect of their investments, because we know that banks invest in a number of areas. So they're just a few things that I generated fairly quickly, um, there may be others, and I just wonder if you're considering those risks, for example. Through the Chair. Thank you, Councillor. So, um, quite a few issues then, and I will, I will look to address those, and, and perhaps others um, who are with me may wish to pick up on some of the more specific points, in particular around finance. Um, just in terms of the framing of the response, I'd like to just clarify that the, the declaration we're discussing today is, um, is focused on divesting <coughs> from fossil fuel producing companies. So that would be oil, gas and coal, for example. Um, also recognising that clearly there are carbon impacts of other organisations, but they are um, separate to the declaration that we're discussing today in terms of those, those issues should be dealt with and should be discussed. Um, but in terms of the declaration, they sit with outside, outside of the scope of the declaration. So that's just a point of clarification I wanted to make. But in terms of just going through your points, in terms of... Um, Auckland Council being the largest farmer in the region, I believe you said, and uh, that being identified as a risk and methane being flagged in the IPCC report. Um, that would be outside the scope of the declaration, but it is something that needs um, careful consideration. And obviously, there is work ongoing in terms of how the, the best practices of the agricultural sector of farmers can be, um, can be adopted more widely through the sector to deliver more widespread change. And that's something that certainly needs to be looked at, but would be... Um, would be outside of the scope of the declaration. Um, in terms of your specific reference to Auckland Airport and Ports of Auckland, um, it, it is outside the scope of the declaration. It would be a, a conversation discussion that, that perhaps should occur, but I would suggest it's something that would, would need to happen in the future around um, those assets being exposed to climate risk. And certainly um, through the work on TCFD, the, the, the work that um, Helen alluded to in terms of our climate-related um, risk in terms of financial risk, um, there is scenario analysis that will be delivered to understand what the risks will be to our assets um, under different climate scenarios. So that work is ongoing, and we will have further, further insight on that. Um, in terms of transport projects, and you touched on the risks associated with transport projects, I think one of the things that um, sustainable finance addresses and, and um, please add further detail to this, I'm, I'm not the sustainable finance expert here, um, is that sustainable finance is, is aimed at um, projects that deliver positive climate outcomes. So we would be looking at funding projects that deliver those positive climate action <coughs> outcomes, such as electric trains, um, walking cycle infrastructure. Um, so by directing our finance towards those type of projects, we would be supporting those. Thank you. Okay. For you, Mr Chair, um, I could probably use some clarification. I'm making the assumption that the money that we have in a bank is an investment, that the money that we're raising through the long-term plan in terms of capital and operation that we're investing in livestock is an investment, and our investment in transport is an investment. And I would have thought that um, the parameters that I see here would cover off those forms of investment. Investment is not just where we place the money um, um, externally, it's Spec where we locate it internally. Yeah. Because we have to raise money to do all of those things. And that might even be why, by way of green bonds or whatever. At, at, the, at the moment, um, we have had a workshop on, on the farms and community facilities focused, and they are working on it. At the moment, the, the issue is that we actually earn an income, so it's actually not where we're not buying, yeah, we're not like borrowing to buy cows. It's actually the other way. Uh, uh, we are effectively. Uh, yeah, but the, the, the issue is we have had a workshop on that and that is going to come through community facilities on how we can, you know, plant up more of our regional parks instead of having grazing. Um, but the issue is if we're mowing that, we're using diesel and petrol by mowing that. So it's a, it's a fine balance. But I think it's to the C40, this specific paper, it's not related, but... Happy to have more conversation around that. I, I guess my concern is that there could be an element of greenwashing in, in what we're putting forward here. It's just a personal. So just through, through you, Chair, just to expand on maybe the comments which have been made, um, and I think they're good ones, but you know, a lot of the stuff that's referred to is, you know, 
um, as Matthew said, outside the scope of this, but it doesn't mean um, you know, there's advantage of signing on to this. It does put the spotlight on some of the activities that we do. Um, and you know, it, it's clear that not everything we do is probably as green or sustainable as it should be. Um, and you know, signing on something like this does put the spotlight on um, what we invest in, what our activities are, and can we do them better? So for example would be that if we couldn't going forward raise most of our money in a green bond format, you might start to question, well, are some of our investments the most appropriate? Is there a better way of doing it? Um, just on a specific question about the banks that we deal with, um, again, it's outside the scope of this, but um, again, banks will invest in a range of different businesses. They are having an increasing focus on those businesses which deliver positive environmental and sustainability outcomes. And that doesn't mean they won't still lend to other providers, but you are starting to see things like pricing differentials uh, in that activity. Um, so certainly if you take some of the Australasian banks, um, they themselves will issue things like green and sustainable bonds, but on the other side, of course, they'll probably still invest to some of the, say, the Australian miners. Thank you. Um, Councillor Coombe, Deputy Chair. Thank you, Mr Chair. Kia ora koutou, and it's great to see um, this work across the Treasury team and the sustainability team, and very happy to support um, the recommendation. <coughs> Just a part I around um, whether our possible additional actions could include um, blue bonds, and we talked about those. We've had a meeting to discuss that, wearing my co-chair of the Hauraki Golf Forum hat, and I think... John and Helen, when you're explaining it, a blue bond is essentially a green bond. But is there is there something more that we could be doing there in terms of um, this declaration? Through the chair, I, I'm not an expert on, on blue bonds, but what I can confirm is that um, the wording of the declaration is um, in such a way that it enables us to um, shape our response. So in terms of increasing our financial investments in climate solutions, which is what the declaration is asking us to do, we can certainly articulate in our, 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 our action plan, the summary table, um, that that is something where we're moving, we're progressing or investigating whatever is appropriate. Um, it's not, it's not um, restricted to green bonds. Um, it is looking at sustainable finance or, or different forms of, um, of investment. Thank you. I think maybe we decided too that blue bonds isn't necessarily the right word for it, but it was investment that could be directed towards um, the the improvements to the Hauraki Golf. Thanks. Yeah, through you, just to expand on that. So, I mean, blue bonds are a you know, subset of green bonds, and there's certainly initiatives we'd look to run probably through our wider green bond framework, um, rather than probably have a separate sort of framework and pool for... Um, specific blue bonds. But it certainly can be a focus of our of our green bond initiatives. Thank you. And there was a lot of support for that from the Haraki Golf Forum. Could I? Could I? Thank you. Uh, Member Wilcox. Yeah, I think I brought this question up once before. And just looking at the C40, I'm struggling to understand a little bit about the green bond. Um, I certainly don't see Dubai, Houston or Austin divesting themselves of all their fossil fuel um, investments. So I'm just kind of a little bit concerned that we're using the green bond when there's no real standard. It only represents 1% of all bond raising. And I'm wondering whether we're getting into a situation where we're just a bit like we were before, where we kind of ended up with differentials and fractionated debt packages and they all named the different things, but they all mean the same. Um, because there is no standard, am I correct? There is no standard for a green bond. The standard for a green bond is environmental and sustainable solutions or outcomes, but there's no standard as to what that outcome is. Or is Cicero not doing that work now? Through, through you, Chair, look, there are um, green bond standards. We have a green bond framework. Um, which you know must meet certain green bond principles, so it's it's very definitive what can qualify as a green bond or not. Um, and to your other point, I think you know well what what represent at the moment one percent of um, the bonds in the world. You know if you go back five years, it would have been 0 0.001 
Um, and I think the, the trend is only going one way. And I think you'll find it becomes um, mainstream financing. And whether it's sort of an agreed bond or a um, some other sustainability or social outcome bond, that is where the world is heading. So my question is, who actually enforces the standards? Um, so I might probably let um, Andrew Helen answer this, but in general, um, there's a there's a framework and there's green bond principles, uh, and there's we have to get that audited that we comply with those principles and standards each year by Ernst and Young, and that's what will go in our green bond annual report. So it's quite a thorough process that we go through to verify that what we're spending the money on um, complies with those frameworks and that it does meet those um, sustainability and climate outcomes which are defined. Look, it's not about the anything else, but it's about using the name green um, because I've seen offerings before of green bonds that were actually just updating properties and things like that and used as a debt package and moved on from there. And I think that's been very clear in the US where they've used it, used it as backup and, and then collateralised that debt into a package and it's still part of a green bond. So I just want to understand that because I'm just concerned that we're using these words green but others aren't applying the same standards that we are and that could not be the case of the C40. Thank you. Through you, Chair, I should expand on that. I mean, the standards around the world on green bonds, they are evolving, and you do have, you know, different standards around the world, uh, but generally they're becoming, the goal is to have them more aligned. Um, but again, you know, if you look at all the issuers in New Zealand um, and through Europe, they follow very strict standards and, and processes to verify that they do meet that, that set criteria. So were you going to tell me about this standard, too, how this standard evolved, or, or are we going to leave that for an offline discussion? Um, yeah, I, I can add a few points to that. Uh, so we are, there is something called the Green Bond Principles and the Climate Bonds Initiative which set up some of these standards. So it, it identifies asset classes and what, what qualifies, uh, you know, how, uh, what kind of... Uh, um, uh, investment will qualify uh, as a green bond. So, so those are, and, the, and the, what's happening now is that in Europe, there is that, uh, they've got the EU taxonomy, which, which d defines it further. So it defines if you're investing in, in, um, some, in, uh, some, in sustainable transport, what that looks like. And uh, so, so that the standards are being built, as, as, as you rightfully say, it, it's, it's, a play, it's an area that's evolving. But what you're saying is that there is greater um, clarity on this, and and it and it is continuing to evolve. I think there was a t period when, as John highlighted, when you know it was a bit uh, blurred. But I think there is there is great, greater clarity now, and the EU, the EU taxonomy is, is something that's that's becoming quite uh, is been is just taking place now, and it's it's something that will define what green bond issuance would look like, and and uh, um, sustainable. Uh, debt products would look like so. It's um, it's it, it's it's an evolving space, I would say, uh, council and and it's um, yeah, and it's uh, it, it's uh, we are not heading back. We are just moving forward in the space. So I'll comment now. My issue is our version of a green bond may not be the same as a North American version, as a North Asian version, as an African version, or and, and so my concern is that we're saying we're green bond, but others actually a lower standard or a different standard, and that concerns me that we're signing up to something that we don't know what other, what around the world is is the standard, and and I'm you know except the name, the only thing that's in common at the moment is the name and the and the sustainable, uh, and and for me that's an issue. Thank you. Just just for you here. To expand on that, I mean, we're using globally recognised um, green bond standards. And so, for example, our most recent 30-year 500 million green bond that attracted investors from, from all around the world because they recognise and accept the green bond principles um, and the climate initiative standards as being um, at, at the top end. So, 
while there may be some other jurisdictions which don't have the same rig around them, I can assure you that they do uh, apply to New Zealand and other, um, you know, European and, and um, you know, destinations. So um, I, don't, I don't think we should have that concern about the green bonds that, that council issues. Thank you. Uh, Member Wilson, last question. Kia ora. Um, just to give some context around why we pose the questions that we pose, um, it does, you know, Independent Māori Stat Board has a board work programme and, and that relates to the environmental resilience, protection and management that's specific to the Māori perspective. So I, I'm just putting in context why the question was posed around green bonds. And my question, albeit I, I don't want a detail level following on from what we're required to, to do, is um, if the council does endorse this declaration and commits to um, further increasing investment in climate solutions, how, uh, how will the piece of work around prioritising uh, where this funding goes? Don't need to have the answer right now. Um, so how will that be prioritised if this resolution moves forward? Um, and how will Māori-focused and Māori-led climate initiatives be prioritised as part of this process? I don't ex expect you to know the answer right off the top of your head. If it can't be done right now, then I'll be seeking that some um, answer would come back uh, for part of the Secretariat to ensure that that happens as as our work um, that we're part of this committee. Through the chair, uh, Kia ora, Member Wilson. So um, uh, in terms of the two points you've raised there, um, what I can confirm is that the signing the declaration is a, is a high level agreement, a high level commitment to increase financial investments in climate solutions. That would be us committing to that over time. Um, how we implement that, and I think that's that's perhaps the, the, the point that you're raising here in terms of how do we ensure that um, the piece around prioritisation and also the important piece around um, Māori focus and Māori led climate programmes, how we do that is, is for us as a council uh, to work on further to ensure that that takes place in an appropriate way. Um, so signing the declaration does not set a direction to that. But what it does do is, is commit to increasing investment in climate solutions for us then to work through how we implement that. And we can, I'd be very keen to discuss that element of it with you, the Secretariat, um, further. Thank you. Sure. Uh, um, thank you, everyone. I have moved this, and Councillor Simpson is happy to second, and she would like to, uh, Councillor Simpson would like to comment. Thank you, Mr Chair. I just want to remind everybody what we're doing here. We signed up uh, to C40, which is a network of global cities committed to addressing climate change. We've signed two declarations, and we are required to sign one more before the beginning of next year. This one is an easy one to sign, in my opinion, because financially we're already doing it. So we're not actually really buying anything into anything that we're not already doing. Yes, I know there are some extra stuff, but we've, we've just had spent hours on the last item telling everybody that we were committed to sort of climate um, investment. We have our green bonds, and let me just talk to you about green bonds. Green bonds are a way to fund things like our um, cycleways, electric trains, they're specific. It might not be the same as everybody else's, but who cares? This is our declaration, our bit, for what we are going to do. So with respect to Dubai and everywhere else, that's fine. But for us, let's look at it, what we're doing. And we, you know, we're going to probably do another green bond issue um, domestically for, before Christmas and maybe bring forward another one offshore. The government don't do it. We, we are leading New Zealand in this space. And I have confidence that actually in signing this declaration, this is putting Auckland at the forefront of both New Zealand and glo even globally about around how we're funding stuff. Now, going back to the last item, everyone's concerned about how we're going to fund this stuff, right? This is just a way, this is another confirmation that we are going to fund ourselves in a sustainable way. So for me, it's a bit of a... Um, a bit of a no-brainer. If we don't sign it, I don't know what else, what are the other declarations left to do. But this, for me, is just something that we are already doing. We're doing it well. We are so, we were doing it so well that we actually closed off 
a green bond issue early because it was so oversubscribed. So um, I, I just support it knowing that it's, it's the work that we're currently doing and we um, are committed at a, as a council to sustainability for the future. Thank you. Kuna, thank you, Councillor Simpson. Anyone else would like to speak? Okay, thank you very much. And just want to say thank you to the team. I know there's a lot of work um, going on with a much reduced uh, staff number at the moment. So we are very proud to have this um, declaration signed. As Councillor Simpson said, we are doing uh, most of the work in here, but this further entrenches and, for, and pushes us um, to do more work, but also uh, encourages and shows others. We're, we're part of 97 cities, part of C40. Those 97 cities um, actually are part of one third of the world's uh, emissions. So us together doing these things, only 14 cities have signed on so far, so a small uh, piece. So if we can encourage other cities to sign on and do the work, we divested from fossil fuels in 2017, um, and then with the green bonds have been ramping up the work and borrowing in a different way, which is actually more affordable as well as um, more sustainable. So thank you very much. Um, we will put that to the vote. All those in favour? Aye. Any opposed? Perfect. Thank you very much. And we will quickly move through the other two items so we can all um, you can all go and head to lunch. Uh, we have no, there's no lunch here. You you gonna have to go to the kebab shop. Um, the Ford Work Program. There are a few changes in there um, and updates. I hope that you've looked. They're highlighted in yellow, removing um, items that we have had and adding more um, focus in other areas. Um, Councillor Simpson has moved, seconded, Deputy Chair. And can I just quickly say, I'm very pleased to see that we have um, our harbours are now added into the work program, Hauraki Golf and Monaco Harbour. Uh, well, we haven't, maybe Kuiper needs to come in as an action as well, but, but that was a bit of a gap. Kia ora, thank you, um, Deputy Chair. All those in favour, oh, sorry, sorry, a question, apologies. Councillor, I'm uh, sorry, uh, Member Wilcox. Yeah, just clear. So I'm just going to have this out with everybody so you know, because my missus gave me help. Somebody sprayed our, our fence line when they shouldn't have. That comes under the Weed Advisory Committee. So, so you all need to know that it's not working perfectly. And I just want to make that really clear. Perfect. And we'd like to follow up on that if you haven't already, Member Wilcox. Um, let us know. Oh, yes. In that yeah. respect, I just note that um, Monsanto or Bayer continues to lose um, uh, lawsuits uh, verifying, which verify that the product that we use around the streets is a uh, cancer-causing agent. Oh, and oh, okay. um, Councillor Walker, that's not relevant to the to the work program um, committee. All those in favour? Aye. Those opposed? Thank you. Now we have summary of items. Uh, Deputy Chair, uh, Councillor Collins, who can move. Deputy Chair, Hippacoum, second. All those in favour? I was going to say something. And there is nothing else? No extraordinary items. No extraordinary, extraordinary items. Thank you all very, very much, and go have an afternoon <laughs> to yourselves. Thank you.